Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Council Member Inez Barron, the Chair of the Committee on Higher Education. Today's hearing is about student unions and non-academic spaces at CUNY campuses. The essential question we want to ask today is whether they are a luxury or a necessity. We're here because the topic of student space at CUNY made headlines when in 2013 the university closed the Morales Shakur Community and Student Center after 23 years of operation at City College. For those who don't know its history, the Morales Shakur Center was a space for student political organizing and advocacy that provided services including textbook lending, a farm share, know your rights training, and a soup kitchen. It came into being when in 1989, City College students, including my council member uh, Rodriguez, Adonis Rodriguez, protested a CUNY tuition increase of nearly 20%. Students occupied the North Academic Center, closing the college for the first time in 20 years, inspiring similar occupations at 13 of the 20 colleges then in the CUNY system. In exchange for ending the protests, the CUNY administration provided students with the Morales Shakur space. The closing of that space against the vocal protests of students called attention to the value many members of the university community placed on it. Those events highlighted the fact that unlike many private colleges, City College does not have anything that would be called a student union and raised the question, why not? To some, student unions are a luxury found on private university campuses. Indeed, the very concept of a student union was born at such elite institutions as Cambridge and Harvard. For much of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, student unions served as social clubs for young white men to amuse and entertain themselves when they weren't studying. If that were all it were today, I would not raise the question of whether or not it was a necessity. But in fact, student unions have become the incubators of student empowerment and social change that have produced some of the most dramatic social and political changes of the last hundred years. When the Association of Student Unions International was founded in 1914 to bring student unions together to share best practices, they defined the purposes of a student, of a student union to, to unify the student body, increase college spirit, and perhaps most importantly, to promote democracy. More than a theory, since the Great Depression, the priorities of student unions have shifted dramatically from purely social functions to economic and political ones. When the 2.2 billion World War II veterans entered colleges on the GI Bill, student unions provided many of the support services that distinguished the veteran population from the regular student body. In the 1960s and throughout the 1970s, students staged sit-ins at student unions to protest the Vietnam War. Student unions increasingly became focused on volunteerism and activism. With the advent of the civil rights and women's movements and the changing demographics of student bodies, student unions re-evaluated their use of space to dedicate office space to specific identity-based groups. For most of the 20th century, City College students were at the forefront of the type of student organizing and protests that grew out of the student union movement. In the 1930s and the 1940s, City College was a major center of student activism for racial equality, social and economic justice, workers' rights, and against student fees. In 1949, 4,000 students protested racism in the faculty. In 1969, students affiliated with the Black and Puerto Rican Student Caucus occupied 17 buildings to demand City College adopt open admissions, which transformed the student population from white to people of color. Knowing this history, I can't but wonder why City College students organized in the past and why it seems so much harder for them to do so now. Where did these campaigns for social change incubate? Where did students find the space to work together? 
Do those spaces still exist now, or have they been surrendered to other university functions? Are such spaces indeed a luxury amid the need for the university to provide other services, or are they a necessity? I think these are important questions. Obviously, we are talking about empowering students, sometimes adversely to the administration of the university. As the university asks the state to approve another tuition increase amid relatively subdued student objections, I can't help but wonder if the lack of student organizing space is interfering with students' ability to collaborate and advance their own interests. In the almost two years that I have occupied this chair, I have said at virtually every hearing that my hope is to restore free tuition at CUNY. But to do that, the students have got to be able to organize and make their voices heard. Students are, should be outraged by the lack of diversity in the faculty, among other issues, and I believe they are. But without the space to organize around the issue, it's understandable that it's difficult to bring people together to improve the CUNY pipeline for college faculty to gain tenure and to move up the ranks. We've seen in the last few weeks with the abject failure of the University of Missouri to properly address race-based harassment of black students that an organized student body is not only a critical check on the university administration that governs it, but that it can also elevate the national discussion so that we can focus our energies on increasing equal opportunity and advancing justice. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues on the committee, uh, Councilmember Cabrera, Councilmember Rodriguez, Councilmember Vaca, and I'd like to thank my legislative director and CUNY liaison, Indigo Washington, the committee's policy analyst, Chloe Rivera, our financial analyst, Jessica Ackerman, and our committee counsel, Jeff Campagna, for their work in preparing for today's hearing. With that, we're going to call the first panel. Jose Magdaleno from Lehman College, Judy Bergtrim from CUNY, Esther Rodriguez Chardonave from Hostos, and Frank, Frank Sanchez from CUNY. I'm going to ask if you would raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to answer all committee questions honestly? Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Judy Bergtraum, and I am the Vice Chancellor for, Facil for Facilities, Planning, Construction, and Management at CUNY. I'd like to take a moment to introduce my fellow panelists. Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, Frank Sanchez, Senior Vice President of Administration and Finance at Hostos Community College, Esther Rodriguez Chardavoyne, and Vice President of Student Affairs at Lehman College. Thank you for this opportunity to be part of a conversation about student space at CUNY. Providing space for all of the university's needs is challenging, particularly, at, particularly as CUNY is the largest urban public university in the nation. On top of that, we are located in an area with very expensive real estate and high costs for construction. Let me be begin by assuring you that every building we build and every renovation we embark on is undertaken to provide CUNY students with the safest, most suitable learning environments possible, which includes space beyond the classroom walls. We strive to create space that allows them to do their very best work. Unfortunately, it is not possible to provide all of the facilities desired at each campus. There are a number of competing forces that intensify the pressure on our facilities portfolio. First, over 40 percent of CUNY's 300 buildings are more than 50 years old, and many of our campuses were not built for specifically for college use. For instance, LaGuardia Community College Center 3 building was originally the Sunshine Biscuit Factory. Queens College was a reform school for boys built in 19, the 1930s. The Graduate Center was previously B. Altman's department store, and the 475 Grand Concourse building at Ostos was a tire factory. These buildings have been adopted for the respective college use, but many need intensive mechanical upgrades and reprogramming for the 21st century learning. A large portion of CUNY's capital program is focused on critical maintenance to bring all of the facilities into a state of good repair. Second, enrollment at CUNY has increased over 
23% over the past decade, representing an increase of more than 50,000 students. Our community college colleges are growing the fastest, with more than half of these students attending one of our seven community colleges. We are pleased and proud that CUNY is serving even more New Yorkers than ever before, but capital investment for additional facilities has not kept up with the increase in enrollment. During the same time period, the university has added 2.2 million square feet of new space. This additional space is only the beginning. Currently, another 1.5 gross square feet of new space is in design or construction for projects throughout the five boroughs. Ostos Community College New Allied Health and Science Building is one of these complex, one of these projects. We currently need 240 million in funding for that building. Student gathering space will be incorporated into that new building and additional space for students can be accommodated in the college's other buildings once this new building comes online. Your support has made, will make this happen. CUNY's capital budget request also includes several major projects to increase space across the campuses. All of these projects require funding in order to bring them to fruition. We can only accomplish these plans with support from the state and the city. And as you know, the city must appropriate funding for the community colleges first, which is then matched by the state. We know that as a community university, it is important that we provide students with space to meet and study between classes. One way, one way we're addressing that is focusing on our libraries throughout the system. At Bronx Community College, the North Hall and Library Building opened in 2012. This new facility houses classrooms on the first floor, which are a great improvement over the college's existing stock of former dorm rooms converted to classrooms, and a state-of-the-art library with an information commons and study areas both for individual study and enclosed rooms for group space. The library at Medgar Evers was recently renovated and expanded. It too has additional technology resources and study areas. A number of our other library renovation projects are also in the works including one at LaGuardia College, Baruch, Lehman, and Queens. Let me share with you for a moment more about Bronx Community College. The 44-acre campus has 36 buildings, some dating back to the 1850s. Yes, the 1850s. CUNY purchased this campus from NYU in the 70s. NYU did not invest very much in the campus for a long period of time before it was sold. Sadly, the city and the state provided little investment for decades after CUNY acquired it. We are making great headways with the campus-wide utility infrastructure project, but there are still two additional phases that require funding of approximately $70 million for which the city must provide half. The college, like all of our community college, has many critical and, and ADA issues. When you receive the university's full capital budget request, you will see that Bronx Community College projects for window re replacement, new roofs, fire alarms, and other things. We work closely with the colleges to understand the facilities demand at each campus. While there are many similarities, each campus has its own issue. When it comes to planning student space, there are many challenges. First, many of the colleges have shortfalls in academic space, and we must prioritize addressing these. Second, many of our students are the first in their families to attend college. We have made a concerted effort to help students navigate the administrative hurdles of attending college by creating one-stop student service offices at various campus. These areas bring together the bursar, the registrar, financial aid, and other student services function to make it easier for students to complete all of the forms necessary for their enrollment. These co-located areas required renovation and thoughtful design to, to truly support our students. Additional one-stop plannings at Bronx Community College and at York. We are requesting $7 million for the student success at Center at Bronx Community College, which is the project that will create the support for Bronx Community College. Planning space for students is not an easy task. While we project future student enrollment based on historic trends and high school graduation rate, it is much harder to project how many students will participate in student cl clubs. Let me give you an example. At John Jay College, there were about two dozen student clubs in 2003 when CUNY began the design of the new building that opened in 2012. Today, there are over 50 clubs that bring students together for academic, cultural, political, and other activities. There was no way to know in 2003 what the increase in student engagement might be in 2015. 
we were able to accommodate 18 student club offices in the building with the idea that student clubs would share space. CUNY is committed to providing the best educational experience to all of its students. That includes both inside and outside of the classroom. As we build new buildings and renovate ex existing facilities, the students are foremost in our mind. We will continue to work with each of the colleges to ensure that we maximize opportunity for students to study, work collaboratively, and grow as a member of the college community and citizen of New York. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair uh, Person Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee. My name is Frank Sanchez. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at the City University of New York. I am pleased to testify before this committee again, particularly on this important question that has been raised. Student unions and, and non-academic spaces on CUNY campuses, are they a luxury or are they a necessity? And I thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, just to provide a kind of a brief historical context to this question, the following statement is from the, the, uh, the report, Role of the College Union, written and adopted by the Association of College Unions International. Uh, actually, in 1956, almost 60 years ago, they defined uh, the role of the College Union. And it reads, you know, the Union is the community center of the college. It is not just a building. It is also an organization and a program. As the living room or the hearthstone of the college, the union provides for the services, conveniences, and amenities the members of the college family need in their daily life on the campus and for getting to know and understand one another through informal association outside of the classroom. The union is part of the educational program of the college. As the center of the college community life, it serves as a laboratory of citizenship, training students in social responsibility and for leadership in a democratic society. Since then, the role, need, and feasibility of student unions have continually evolved to stay current with student needs, preferences, as well as college resources. The very first, actually, student union was established at the University of Pennsylvania in 1896. It housed a bowling alley, swimming pool, gymnasium, food court, theater, meeting space for students. And despite Penn's groundbreaking vision for higher education, the early 1900s saw very few student unions in the U.S. Then, in the 1950s, the number of student unions increased dramatically throughout the nation. The quote I read, I think, captures the vision for student unions in the 1950s, but times change, and so have the function, role, and fiscal feasibility of student unions on campuses across the country. In the 1970s, the function of student unions changed primarily as a result of economics. The 1970s saw a decline in student enrollment, which meant a decline in student fees. On most campuses across the country, and actually including CUNY, specifically Brooklyn College and Queens College, Student fees uh, provided the primary financial support for student unions, and with less revenue from student fees, student unions became costly for colleges and universities to maintain. Today, the changing campus environment and changing needs of our students require that institutions to be responsive to all students as it relates to spatialization, and in particular, the use of multi-purpose space. Today, college unions are no longer only spaces on campus designed to create social and intellectual engagement. In a recent report on physical space in higher education, it was noted that flexibility, adaptability, responsiveness, and a sense of ownership may be more important than the architectural and tradition or permanence of most campus facilities. In the 21st century, multi-purpose space may better meet the needs of today's students. While the college union may have uh, been seen in 1956 as a community center of the college, today's campuses build community and student engagement successfully in a variety of ways. And we actually see this in the way our students are engaged with each other, uh, both inside and outside the campus, and, for, and, and uh, inside and outside the classroom, as well as outside of the campus. For example, um, uh, students are identifying a variety of multi-purpose spaces. Those who study uh, spatialization in higher education make note that in higher education, 
uh, facilities designed to be multifunctional to meet the needs of multiple constituents are one way to engage in ongoing change and delivery of programs and services. Today, seven community colleges have either a student union or a student center, yet CUNY has also seen uh, significant enrollment growth, consequently student interests in clubs and, and organizations. Outside of those uh, campuses that have a student unions and student centers, the rest of the campuses probably have over 1,400 different clubs and organizations, most of, most of which uh, are at these remaining uh, campuses. The enrollment growth and limitations of student space speaks to the need of the use of multi-purpose space for student groups. On CUNY campuses where there is no uh, union or center, students use room reservation systems of the campus. This system identifies available classrooms and conference rooms for student meetings and gatherings. On other campuses, students reserve space through their student life or student activities offices. Space is available in academic and non-academic buildings. In addition, uh, many uh, campuses have lounge uh, areas or open space areas where students can hang out uh, between classes or studying or just socializing. A few have game rooms or recreation rooms that have multiplayer games such as pool or foosball, a television and other activities. Generally, these spaces cannot be officially reserved uh, for regular meetings as the purpose of these spaces for the general student body uh, to use in their free time. In terms of technology, we now see that social media has turned the entire collegiate experience into a digital student union. Today, students communicate, organize, plan, meet, announce via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, blogs, and more. In fact, many believe that social media has made it easier for students to connect. It is fascinating to me when I go on to any variety of CUNY student group uh, Facebook pages to see how the medium is used so effectively. In fact, uh, for example, sites like the Black Male Initiative, the Coalition with Students with Disabilities, and CUNY Dreamers effectively use social media as a way of organizing and communicating and creating a sense of community with each other. Finally, the, tradition, uh, the traditional definition of student unions may no longer be feasible financially. Space designed to be multifunctional and to meet the needs of multiple constituents has become a strategy for coping with financial constraints, yet still providing students with space for co-curricular activities, meetings, and events. Colleges and universities are looking to multi-purpose spaces in order to meet the needs of multiple student groups as well as the university community. Are student unions and non-academic spaces on CUNY campuses, are they a luxury or a necessity? Clearly, and with no doubt in my mind, non-academic and multi-purpose space on CUNY campuses is a necessity. With this set said, more space is needed. I believe our colleges are working hard to meet the need of CUNY students through use of multi-space that can be shared, reconfigured, and made private. And while the robust use of social media has dramatically increased a sense of community and student engagement, the availability of new space would further facilitate meeting these important student interests. In closing, again, I'd like to thank uh, Chair Barron and the Higher Education Committee for this opportunity, and I'm happy to take uh, questions when we're ready. Uh, good afternoon, buenas tardes. My name is Esther Rodriguez Chardavoin, and I am the Senior Vice President <coughs> of Administration and Finance at Eugenio Maria de Hostos Community College. I would like to thank Chairperson Barron and the committee for giving me the opportunity to share information about Hostos Community College physical plan and how students are able to use space on our campus. Hostos Community College is, is at the intersection of East 149th Street and the Grand Concourse. The college began its life in 1968 in a converted tire factory, the A building, and in an abandoned insurance office building, the B building. <coughs> These buildings house classrooms, labs, and offices. It wasn't until 1992 that a building design to be a community college facility opened. The East Academic Complex included a cafeteria, theater, 
gymnasium, a swimming pool, and student organizations offices, classrooms and academic offices as well. As in the early 1990s, in addition to the A building, was constructed to house the library, classroom, and offices. The two buildings are linked with a bridge over the Grand Concourse. This bridge has become an icon for the college, but more importantly, it has become a significant event and meeting spaces for students, a student common in this congested urban neighborhood. The Savoy, a modular build, building erected in the 1980s as a swing space, and now houses student support offices and other support services. There are two major avenues by which students may obtain access to space. The first and more formal method is through our student organizations, which are granted clubs office space and can reserve space on campus. All clubs established or newly formed must adhere to the rules and regulations as they are enforced cooperatively by the Student Government Association, the SGA, and the Office of Student Affairs. Each year, the Office of Student Activities prepares a list of clubs eligible for certification based on completion of an application. The SGA has the final say on club certification, reserving the right to withhold certifications for previous infractions or violation of the SGA Constitution or CUNY bylaws. Clubs are certified and are assigned office space shared with one or two other clubs, depending on space availability. These clubs can also apply for funding, which can be used to hold events and, and book campus spaces. Students who wish to reserve a space on our campus but are not members of any student organizations have the ability to reserve space indirectly. An existing club may sponsor that student and submit space requests. All students' organization requests for space are reviewed by the college-wide Space Reservation Committee. The function of the Space Reservation Committee is to ensure whether the requested space is adequate and appropriate for the proposed activity. The second opportunity for students to gather is our open spaces. Open spaces such as our iconic bridge between the East Academic Complex and the A Building have been, have been maintained on campus as a way to provide areas where students can study or meet for more informal purposes, providing them with a way to keep engaged in campus life. As a higher education institution, our priority has always been to provide sufficient space for instructional needs, a library, computer labs, and student services. When square footage is limited, open spaces become, a short, become short change. However, because of the opportunity afforded by the new Allied Health Building, the college has made open space an essential part of the building's design from the start to the planning process. I would like to thank this committee for the opportunity to share how Hostess Community College, as part of the City University of New York, has provided non-academic spaces to our students on campus. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank Chairperson Barron, as well as all of the members of the committee, for the opportunity to speak with you today on this very important matter. My name is Jose Magdaleno, the Vice President of Student Affairs at Lehman College, and I'm pleased to have an opportunity to tell you about our work with students and the student space that's available uh, to Lehman College students. As you know, Lehman College is the only CUNY Senior College in the Bronx, where we serve approximately 12,400 undergraduate and graduate students. About half of our students are of Latino descent, and an additional third are of African and African American descent. Many are the first in their families to attend college. And of course, as you also know, we're a commuter school located 
in an urban area of the borough. Like many CUNY and other public colleges, our students lead very busy lives. Many have full-time jobs, they have families, and other responsibilities. The student life facility at Lehman College plays a key role in the college experience we offer to our students. It is an essential common space that fulfills an important need. It's a multi-purpose facility, a gathering space, and certainly a study space. It's also a programming space for lectures, films, the performing arts, and our student-run media. Our student newspaper and our radio station are housed there. As has been mentioned, students, faculty, staff, and administrators need a common meeting space to personalize relations with, with each other and create an intellectual environment outside the classroom. To put it simply, the Student Life Building at Lehman College is the living room of our campus. In 2014, over 20,000 students and other visitors came to the Student Life Building at Lehman. And if you will, please allow me to give you some background on our Student Life facility. Originally built in 1980 as a temporary structure, the Student Life Building underwent a $1.8 million renovation in 2012-2013 that transformed the facility. Students were involved in the redesign of the building and renovations at every stage and even helped select the furniture. In addition to the new furniture, the renovation program included internet connections in each student office, widescreen monitors in our new conference rooms, 20 wireless routers for high-speed access to the internet, and a laptop computer lending program. The building now boasts eight new club rooms for a total of 32 rooms in addition to the space allocated to student government. The Student Life Building currently houses 45 student organizations and the offices of the Student Government Association. Now, while the renovation has provided additional space, rooms must still be shared. Each semester, space allocations are made for registered Lehman College student organizations based on the recommendation of the Campus Facilities Officer of the Student Government Association. The Office of Campus Life, which, which teaches leadership and public service skills, as well as the Herbert H. Lehman Center for Student Leadership Development is also housed in the building. The Lehman Leadership Program provides training to approximately 450 students each year who participate in leadership development seminars, as well as community service projects. WASA, which is the name of the architectural firm that designed our building's new dramatic main entrance, also created the Herbert H. Lehman Leadership Lounge, where students in our leadership program meet. The Office of Campus Life and our Alumni Affairs Office recently held a 10th anniversary reunion of student leaders, and many of, of the program's alumni returned to our facility to reconnect, to network, and celebrate because they are among Lehman's proudest graduates. The Herbert H. Lehman uh, Leadership Center recently began a mentorship program in association with the White House. This program is hugely successful, and we're proud to note that one of our alumni, someone you, you may have heard of, a gentleman by the name of Elias Alcantara, now works in the White House as the Associate Director of Intergovernmental Affairs. Indeed, Mr. Alcantara was instrumental in facilitating President Obama's visit to Lehman College in May 2015, an event that made headlines worldwide and shined a bright light on Lehman, the City University of New York, and New York City. 
Another example of the activities and programs conducted in the Student Life Building is the annual 24-hour hackathon sponsored by the Association of Black Engineers, where computer-savvy Lehman and other CUNY students worked on solving tech problems and met representatives from major blue-chip firms like Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan. The building also houses the Student Life Art Project, a student art installation that includes colorful wall murals in the lower level, as well as student photography on the upper level. The staff at the Student Life Building works closely, not only with student government, but also with clubs and organizations and their faculty and staff advisors to assist in developing and executing programs that foster the social and intellectual skills that will serve our students throughout their lives. It's important to note that the Student Life Building is not simply a gathering spot, but rather is a place where students learn life lessons such as budget management, public speaking, how to work with diverse groups, project planning and implementation, negotiation and conflict management, and in the final analysis, how to work as a team to get things done. These are life lessons that are as important as any and complement the skills and perspectives that our students develop inside our classrooms. In the final analysis, I am firmly convinced that the Student Life Building at Lehman College is an essential element of our students' college-going experience. Every 21st century college needs such a facility. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your testimony and for coming to take time to share with this committee your view on this topic that we're talking about today. And it's raised um, several questions for me, and my colleagues also will have questions that they would like to offer to you. Uh, first, question, first question goes back to Fitterman Hall. What was the designation for the original Fitterman Hall that was uh, destroyed during the attack of 9-11? Was that Fitterman Hall for student services? Was that the designation of Fitterman Hall? Fitterman Hall, the way it exists now and the way it was a combination, it was for students. No, no, I'm talking about the original, the first, the one that was the one established. That it, it was, was classrooms, offices, and had student space. Okay. And, and the, the new building basically mirrored what the building that was destroyed had. Okay. So and, it, and ha it has the same proportions? You know what? I don't, I, I wasn't involved in the first one, um, mm -hmm. so I don't know, but it has, it has student space that's open um, and then it's really informal. Then it has student space where students can meet in groups. And then it has an area that is um, students can meet in larger groups. So it's got every type of student space. Okay. So the same um, requirements or the same accommodations for the original were transferred over, but you're yes, not sure yes. in what. Uh, okay. And in terms of student fees that CUNY collects, what, what is the amount that students pay annually in student fees? Um, in terms of student activity fees, actually vary across the colleges. A number of our colleges have been begun to increase. Many of our, for example, John Jay, I think a year and a half ago, two years ago, they hadn't seen a change in their student fee for over 25 years. In fact, the student government took the initiative to raise the fee to provide more services. But it ranges in terms of the student activity fee. This wouldn't be inclusive of technology and all the other fees. But the student activities range uh, between probably 57 to 80, 85 uh, dollars per student per semester. And how are those funds allocated? What are they used for? What's the purpose of those? They're, they're used for a variety. It really depends uh, because they're student driven, and, and the way you get an inf uh, establish a fee or a fee increase is you have to do a student referendum, which means it goes to student vote. 
and frankly, the students will vote on how the fees are used. For example, there's a brand new increase in fee at LaGuardia, and the students said they wanted to have uh, uh, intercollegiate athletics, and so they created a fee to support their athletic infrastructure and, and to develop it. But it, it, it varies uh, from campus to campus a little bit. So you said it's student-driven. So if the students didn't want an increase in their student fees, they could prevent an increase in student fees? Absolutely. They could maintain it? Uh, and, so, and so what often happens is uh, you, in fact, you find that a lot through these referendums, is you may get a student government or a student group uh, proposing and trying to get a petition or referendum going uh, in order to get it on the ballot. And mm -hmm. then students can vote. Uh, as to whether or not they support it uh, or, or don't. And uh, every year we see any variety of student fees either shut down or approved by students. Uh, next question comes in terms of cost, and uh, actually, uh, Mr. Sanchez, it's in your statement. Uh, the line which to me says it all and sort of was very stark, it said, I think, Finally, traditional definition of student unions may no longer be feasible financially. Um, space designate, designed to be multifunctional and to meet the needs of multiple constituents has become a strategy for coping with financial constraints, yet still providing students with space for co-curricular activities, meetings, and events. In terms of these uh, multifunctional, multipurpose spaces, that we're seeing colleges have. What does that mean in terms of an organization, a student government that has records, that has files, that have to keep minutes and documents? How then are they to share in an open space and maintain the integrity of their documents? When? I'm, see, I'm differentiating I'm student governments from student organizations. I'm differentiating sure, the sure, two. Sure. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not clear on what the question is. Right. Again. So if there's no designated room for the student government to secure oh. their documents. Right. So, so uh, it's my understanding, I, I think on all of our campus, I believe that for student government there's designated space. Um, I, I think I think I'm pretty, yo, please, yeah, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain about that. So I'm going to speak about Osos Community College. Um, so yes, there's spaces for, for student government. We have offices for them. Mm -hmm. And then we have also space for clubs. So the clubs have file cabinets. They have a desk. And they have a copier. Let's say they need to make copies for, for, for their members. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, the student life coordinator works very closely with the student uh, clubs to make sure that any documents that they have is secure. As you know, uh, in most cases, some of our clubs may only last one year right. and then they don't get refunded again right. or they don't have enough members or in, in the year something happens and they just, they just disavow. So we try for purposes of making sure that the accounting records are there, especially when it comes to funding, that we have something that has an order trail. So those records are usually kept in the student life area. Um, when we talk about uh, students using open space, we're really talking about students wanting to gather to, ha to start a conversation, uh, you know, a as a way for them to brainstorm whatever they choose to, to, to move forward. So that's when we talk about the open space. But clearly, um, if an organization has some information that they want to secure, then in our campus, they seek out the student life coordinator to ensure that they have a, a safe place to keep that information. Okay, so um, I think I heard you say in your testimony that they can appeal to someone who arranges for the space to be um, designated. So it's not like I have an office or a room where my club is and I know that if I go to that room, I'll have access to that room. 
So arrangements have to be made in advance. I don't know how well, far in advance. Well, when I was speaking about arrangement of space, I was right. really so. So there are two there 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 are two avenues by which we I, I spoke to, and that was clearly the the student organizations. Once they're certified, they are then assigned an office, and that office can have two or three clubs. At at all those, uh, we have sharing to, sharing. Okay. So, so they have to make some arrangements on how, you know, which top of the file cabinet, you know, Club A is going to have and so forth. When I was talking about the open spaces is, is that other students who are really not student organizations but are maybe, a, you know, five or six students that have developed some kind of interest. And so for there, those students may want to get a space, reserve a space, so that they can have a meeting, and and usually they 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 do it two ways. They either find a club that will sponsor them to have that, or they themselves can 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 fill out the form. Again, they get guidance and assistance through the student activity. We find that that connection helps the student, and it also answers a lot of the questions that they may have. How is the determination made as to where a particular uh, club or organization will have their space? Who determines where their space will be located? Well, right now in the, in the East Academic Building, the building that I spoke about, that, that was the one that is more of a, the community college design. Right now we have 12 designated office club offices. So who decides who gets, you know, the corner? space with actually, the windows actually or a student government. second floor or it, first you know we, we as as student government leaders they're the ones that make those decisions they're the ones that work <laughs> with the club organizations to designate uh, the space uh, I think uh, it's it's not a good approach for administrators to tell which club to go where so the SGA usually is 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 the one that designates that on, on all those okay I have some more questions, but I'm going to ask my colleagues. Uh, who was first? <coughs> Vaca? Councilmember Vaca, you have some questions, and I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I appreciate all your testimony. I'm basically on the same page as you. Uh, I know that it's important to have student space. Mm -hmm. I think that how we view student space has to be a constantly evolving process because students have different needs, and students that I know are talking about child care issues, family issues, support issues, counseling issues. Uh, many of them don't know where to go, how to access those type of services. Mm -hmm. And I also want to stress that when you allocate space, there has to be a level of confidentiality space. Many of the students want to speak to staff, and what they're talking about um, often relates to health and to family and to individual problems. Do you have space available where there is counseling available to students that is of a confidential, isolated type nature that they can feel to, uh, comfortable talking to staff? Well, I'm going to speak about all those, but also my colleague from Lehman, you know, will chime in. So yes, we have counseling areas, and, and, and the counselors have their own offices, uh, and students can go to them and have a private conversation for us, that's paramount on our campus to make sure that students have someone that they can go to and have a confidential uh, discussion about a host of issues. As you know, we do have a child care center on our campus. Uh, we also have a single stop process on OSTOS, which usually is the uh, forefront where students may go and, and describe their issues and, and some of their concerns. And it's, it is from there that they're usually recommended as to who they need to speak to with regards to their issue. Uh, let me say a word about Lehman's uh, situation. Uh, we uh, have a discrete uh, personal counseling center with private office space uh, where students can meet with counselors who provide confidential support and referral services to a variety of external agencies as well as internal services that we provide at the college. We were delighted to inaugurate a new child care center uh, about three years ago. 
uh, which is, uh, of course, a critical service for our students. I'd just add very quickly, I think uh, the private and discrete space is incredibly important for a number of our student populations. For, for example, we've started uh, several new initiatives that I think this type of space is particularly important. Uh, we're expanding foster care uh, or support for our students in foster care, which can be a very uh, kind of sensitive topic working with students. We're now working closely with the Food Bank of New York City to expand uh, significantly a number of food pantries, which again is a, is a service and support for our students that ideally is in a place that's more discreet, easy, accessible, uh, and it's, it's uh, made available to students, uh, you know, how they want to receive it, but uh, very important to have that space available. I know that students must come to you with a variety of causes, variety of issues, and I don't see how it's possible to allocate space to each and every cause or each and every viewpoint. Students are entitled to voice their viewpoints, and they should be encouraged to speak out. But allocation of space for each and every viewpoint must be a very difficult proposition. Um, and uh, I would prioritize health, counseling, and uh, home, um, I say homework, but uh, completing assignments. Uh, I think language is also an issue with many of our students where they want to receive counseling and sometimes they're concerned about reaching out. So I would look from, on a generic level at the, the level of confidentiality and the fact that space is always at a premium. Uh, we take for granted that because we have many CUNY campuses with large grounds that there's so much space. Uh, I think it's much different. Uh, I, I know sp space is at a premium, and as was mentioned in someone's testimony, you take a college like Bronx Community, where so many of the buildings are so old and, and, and in need of capital investment. So I think that you have to use your judgment. And, and I think that there has to be student government involvement. And everything I've seen has been that the student governments have been involved, that elections are being held on campuses. And, and that's very important to me, that there be student government in, in all the uh, college campuses. So I, I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. In terms of the Child Care Center, what's the status of the Child Care Center at City College? The, the, as a matter of fact, the last time that um, I came before you, um, we talked about that. The status of it, we're in the process of design. Um, that will be finished by sometime in the spring. Then we'll bid it out and uh, go into construction, and it should be ready by September of 2017. And what happened to the students uh, who were at that, the children who were at that center, that child care center? I understand that the children at that child care center went to other facilities. And is someone tracking them so that at the time that the center reopens, they'll be offered the opportunity to return? I, I would have to ask that question to the school, but I'm sure that they are. Okay. Uh, I would love to know that. Okay. And um, in terms of the reopening, uh, what are the plans for who that facility would be available to? What well, clientele would be offered an opportunity to use that facility? So, uh, so we actually uh, looked at uh, the policy that supports our child care centers and made modifications. I guess it's about three, three and a half years ago. The original policy really put limitations uh, for our child care centers and that it only allowed for child care centers, uh, regardless of uses uh, or even their, their physical stability, only to serve students. And so what we did in, in, in modifying the policy is we said absolutely students must be the very first priority for any space that's available at a child care center. Once that need has been met and there is no waiting list, students can then uh, propose to make, it br uh, make the availability broader uh, for faculty as the second priority and then the community as the third priority. Uh, but only when and after all the student needs have been met. So that initiative of opening it up would come from the students, opening the facility to faculty and community? Is that what I understand you to say? No, that the administration of the child care center would ensure that through their marketing and promotion, 
that the needs of students are being met first. Yes, and then once those needs are met, how would we say who would be the uh, authorizing body right. to expand so, those so, services to So others? the request, the request can come from the director of the child care center or oftentimes child care centers are under the vice president of student affairs. They can make a request to say uh, we have exhausted our options uh, for students. There's still space available and instead of leaving a seat unfilled, we want to now open it up to our faculty, uh, maybe staff community. And who would have the final de uh, decision? That would be through my office. Oh, so we don't have to worry. If it's through your office, we'll know that that will be uh, something we can expect to have happen. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Th there's been a number of requests from colleges. Okay. In terms of student space, uh, I asked how the determination was made as to who got what areas, and you said basically you allow the uh, student organizations to determine that. What happens when, who determines that a space should be closed? What are the situations that would close a space? So as I indicated in, 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 in my testimony that if the uh, student government, the, the, the government. Can you speak into the mic, please? Thank if you. the student government themselves feel that somehow the club itself is violating uh, some of their own constitution uh, laws, <coughs> then they're usually the ones that will bring up, uh, you know, some some grievance against that. But uh, they have to bring it to the student activity coordinator and to the vice president. There has to be due process before an actual club is, is, is closed. At least that's the process that we follow at Hostos Community College. Okay, so you're speaking for Hostos. Who can I speak for CUNY? Well, I guess it would be me. There's, okay. pr there's processes uh, that are slightly different depending on how, in this case we're talking about unions or student centers or student life building, depending on how they evolve. For example, uh, I believe Queens College, Brooklyn College that were established by student fees, there's, uh, there's an association that's governed uh, in large part by students and, and I think a couple of faculty seats and administrators that make determinations of the use uh, of the space. Other uh, colleges that may not have that infrastructure have their own kind of set of governance and processes for making decisions about, about space. So, th so there's a lot of, lot of variability. Uh, depending on how the college uh, center evolved. And would those uh, closures happen spontaneously, overnight, middle of the semester, you know, without having any kind of due process to allow the club to respond to a, uh, an effort to have them closed? Um, I, I, think, I think oftentimes uh, there is a, if there is, if it's being utilized and there's a clear point of contact, uh, either a president or a club, even, even if the organization has become uh, not functioning, but as long as there is a recognized club and where you identify a president, vice president, absolutely that point of contact is contacted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if, they're, they're, if it's determined the space hasn't been utilized or isn't being utilized or there hasn't been a successful effort to make contact, uh, I could see, you know, halfway through the year, an institution saying, well, we've, we haven't made contact yet and we need to repurpose this uh, to meet other student needs. Absolutely, I could see that. Okay, happening. so then to that point, the Guillermo Morales Asada Shakur Center that operated at City College, mm -hmm. what prompted that closure? That's, uh, I think we have some, CCNY uh, folks here, I, I, I couldn't tell you. You couldn't speak to that? No, no, in so. terms of the, the process of that. Okay, well, if they, um, um, did they, when they closed, would they notify you that uh, space has been closed and would they give you any kind of notice or report uh, or? Not, not, not necessarily. I mean, uh, what the CUNY has really tried to do over the years, uh, and, and uh, Judy, Judy may be able to speak to this as well, is we work very hard to, um, 
uh, have the leadership of the campuses try to, in, in the best interest of their students and, and their campus, try to make decisions independent in, in some ways uh, of certainly uh, some of the CUNY administration, more autonomy and more support for decision making. So in this case, as a vice chancellor for student affairs, if there's a president that says we need to, uh, you know, our students are requesting more and more to provide space for uh, a single stop operation, uh, that provides critical, you know, food services, tax preparation, legal and financial counseling. They may identify whether whether it's a student club, or maybe it's a, an office space, or maybe it's even a classroom space. Uh, you know, part of our testimony was was looking at, in this case, student union space. But how do we repurpose and create multi-purpose space across the board so that we have maximum flexibility to meet the needs of our students? And so. Uh, uh, a president could could say this is a high priority whether it's career services or it's a single stop operation or in the case of John Jay they said absolutely we have to carve out space for student clubs and orgs and so in the building of that new structure there's significant student club space that was a hot top priority uh, by the president and the leadership. I wasn't consulted on that as a vice chancellor for student affairs. I absolutely supported it, but I certainly wasn't consulted for it. By the way, if I could just add, the moment that the new space at John Jay opened, while it had significant student club space, it still didn't meet all the need mm -hmm. uh, that the students have. Right. So how do we then protect the students from perhaps an administration that is insensitive to what they feel their needs are, and that doesn't give them the uh, opportunity to um, appeal a decision, decision that has been made, so that it doesn't appear to be an arbitrary or right. uh, I think, dictatorial I think, decision. Absolutely, I think there's a- We talk about encouraging students and empowering students and giving students the opportunity to decide where the space is going to be. Absolutely. So now how do we then, in contradiction to that, have no, that. No, absolutely. And while our, our testimony, you know, talked about how the, the notion of student union has changed, I think we're in agreement that the spirit of the student union needs to be preserved where students have the opportunity to come together, to congregate, and discuss whatever they want, whether it's in opposition to the administration or not. So I think there are a couple of different ways that if students don't feel like they're having due process, uh, they certainly can contact the Central Office of Student Affairs, ask for due process. Their student government actually, uh, absolutely is advocating, and if they're not, we got to ask well, how are they getting voted in the office, but students need to hold their student uh, government folks uh, accountable. But due process is out there, and I'll give you an example where we saw very recently we weren't particularly happy in terms of uh, the degree in which students were involved. We heard from the USS, University Student Senate, and a number of our student body presidents saying that they weren't actively engaged at the level that they should be with tech fees. And we said, well, this is tech, I mean, students are paying a lot of money to provide technology support across this university. They need to be involved with some of the decisions around the use of those resources. And so what we ended up doing is we ended up sending a memo. Uh, I believe the Vice <coughs> Presidents of Student Affairs received a memo from me. I believe your presidents received a memo from our Chief Operating Officer uh, 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 encouraging and supporting and requesting that the administration uh, involve students in those processes. Um, and gave, gave clear guidance. Uh, Councilman McAbeira has a question, but just before he poses his questions, in terms of the student activity fees, I understood you to say the students can put it on a referendum and then it comes to vote. Is that also the process with the student technology fees? There, uh, no, there's two processes okay. for that. Uh, uh, the student, uh, this exclusive, the student activities, and I can't cite the bylaws that define it out, okay. but the administrative fees uh, versus the student activity fees have uh, different um, processes. Okay. So what's the student involvement in the um, tech fees that we're talking about where they seem to express some displeasure with how it's functioning? So now, so now there's uh, committees uh, that the administration uh, convenes and, and there's, I don't know what the ratio is, but there's uh, student involvement on these tech fee committees 
and believe me, I've worked very closely with the, the last two uh, uh, USS chairs and student trustees because it's been an issue in, in trying to push and make sure our, our campuses are responsive to student involvement. Uh, so students people. are involved, but they're not in that decision-making portion. They're involved, they have input, uh, but... If I may... Yes, um, please. Student, um, uh, students are voting members of our technology advisory committee. Mm -hmm. and in what ratio? Uh, they're about 35 to 40 percent of the membership on that committee, and they have a voice and vote on all of the proposals that come before the committee, and they also have the opportunity to make proposals <coughs> from student government. And is that the same across CUNY? <clears throat> each one has got, each tech committee has got about 35 percent students? Yes. I mean, as I think what Vice Chancellor Sanchez indicated, that there were two memos that went out. Yes. One clearly was for the student, uh, uh, for the student uh, vice president's area, and then there was one for the finance area. And clearly both memos were, spoke of the same. It spoke about, one is that, the makeup of the committee and and that you had to have a larger portion of students on the committee but any any time you establish a committee in that form when it deals with dollars they have to be a voting member so they have the they are empowered to vote on proposals that have moved forward as well as bringing their own as uh my colleague here indicated so and so i just want to take it one step further mm -hmm. because even though we do what's called a plan technology which is submitted to the central office there's also the opportunity for them to view that plan they basically look to see uh, the student ratio once again they double check to make sure that there were sufficient students uh, from that particular campus and then they look at the projects that that are being submitted and if there are questions usually the committee gets back questions and then we have to answer them and then we get a final approval so there is always that dialogue going on okay thank you mm -hmm. council member cabrera thank you for your patience thank you uh first of all i, I appreciate uh, your acknowledgement that bronx community college is in dire need of uh, construction uh, funding uh, is, is something that I have uh, pointed out from day one that I've been here and I will continue. So thank you for that level of acknowledgement. At the same time, very grateful to have the, the best looking library, I think, mm -hmm. in the whole CUNY system. Uh, it's simply amazing. Um, you, you first mentioned that we have a lot of facilities that are old. And as I heard that argument, um, I was thinking about Harvard. I was thinking about Yale. I was thinking about Princeton, because uh, they are much older. Uh, so the fundamental problem that I see here <coughs> is not that they're old. It's that you're not being provided the funding in order to, to fix the problem. And I think that's the problem they always will really deal with CUNY. We come and say, CUNY, how can you not doing this? especially at the state level, I think you should be receiving a lot more funding to accommodate and to deal with these problems, 23% increase. Is this 23% as of date, or this was a couple of years ago? This is as, as of date. As of date. Uh, from 23% compare us to when? I think it's 10 years. Yeah. 10 years ago. So, I mean, this is a significant increase. What is really needed is that CUNY gets the funding that it needs in order to do the job. And that predominantly, I see, has to come from the state level. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep using this bully pulpit to say that you guys need the funding so our students could get everything that they actually need and not trying to take from Peter to Paul and then get a house divided from within uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the administration students, to me, have the, the same goal, which is, to me, college is about knowledge and skill. Everything else is to support that and to get the knowledge and skills so they have the preparation in order to move forward in life uh, where their dreams and occupation, et cetera. Uh, so that's, that's the first thing I wanted to mention. Uh, 
the second thing, and I just want clarity, and then I'm going to go to the third question, which is that in most of our campuses, are you having an accommodation problem? I just wanted to have clarity. Is, is, is it a designated problem that they have permitting space for the clubs, for the unions, for student government, or is it more trying to accommodate when they can meet in a particular room? What, what's, the, what's the norm? Okay. And I, I wanted more from the CUNY, I know, because you have the perspective of the virtual college, and I, I heard what you have, but I just wanted to get an overall picture citywide. What, what's, what's the great, what's the, you understand my question? That, okay, go ahead. If you could repeat it. Well, okay, so good. basically what I want to know is that, is your biggest problem right now that you don't have enough space in the average campus, or do you also have a, a problem on accommodating certain slots for the student government, for, well, student government got the designated space, for, for the clubs, for the unions, uh, accommodating time for them? No, no, it's, it's space. It's it, space. It, 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 we need more space. Uh, Did I you have this I problem 10 years ago? Oh, well, the, the, not as bad. Not as bad. So over fund the last 10 years, enrollment uh, has grown at least one and a half, maybe two times the size of NYU. So that has precipitated Absolutely. more clubs. Is that is well, that what I'm hearing? There's more if, clubs, therefore if, if, more clubs than others. If you take an increase of fifty thousand students and you just divide that by the typical, you know, enrollment in any one of our schools, that could produce another five schools. No, so, no, I hear you, so, but so I, you could have five schools and have less clubs. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. Is, it, is it the amount of clubs? Yeah. Because you, I, mean, I, I don't foresee this, but you can have a college that said, students say, oh, we don't care about clubs, we just wanna get our degree and get out of here and get a job. Right. You know, so what? No, it's an it's important question. Let me, let me just spend just a, a minute uh, talking about how we're beginning to see the changing demographics of our student profile. It's actually pretty fascinating what's happening at CUNY. So uh, everyone has heard we've grown, we've grown, we've grown, but what's happened is the, the student uh, profile has changed pretty dramatically in that over the last 10, 15 years, uh, 10 to 15 years ago, the average age was right about 26, 27 years of age. Today, the average is 23, and we're seeing many, many, many more students who are traditional age students coming into CUNY, 18, 19, 20, than we did the last 10 years. So yeah. what's happening as we're beginning to see that traditional age students come to CUNY looking for better quality engagement, better student activities, better student life, uh, more club uh, opportunities. In fact, we have students coming to our campuses creating clubs. In fact, to any of the students that are here, I encourage you, if there isn't a club, I, I encourage you to propose it and get it established. And you know, of course, it has to meet the requirements of the recognized student club uh, kind of process. But that's what's happening. We're I seeing see. a younger population of students that are wanting to get more engaged. We also, just over the last, uh, uh, really more so in the last five uh, to seven years, the growth of residences. And so now we have 3,200 students to live on campus. That is also, and you can talk to anyone at Staten Island, you can talk to anyone at Queens College, they will tell you that the resident, the creation of the residence hall there transformed their student life, student club, their campus life experience. Because when you have students that live 24 seven on the campus, they're spending their time getting involved in clubs, student government, campus activities, and that has also caused the need to create more clubs and orgs and again, a greater attention with space. But what I hear is that you're getting more students who are actually an extended adolescent period because they're still living with their parents. Uh, some of them are not working uh, and they have more time in their hands. Uh, and so I'm living in a residence because, you know, all their needs are basically taken yeah. care of and they want to do life together. It, that's uh, absolutely okay. right. In fact, you mentioned you. work. You mentioned work today and it's, it's flip-flopped over the last 15 years. Today, 70% of all CUNY students work less than 20 hours a week. 
as compared to as 10 compared years ago? As compared to 15 years ago, it was flip-flop. So you have data on that? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, l let me just share. I mean, at the end of the day, what I hear, there's only two options here unless I, I love to hear what the students have to say. Uh, but the, the two options is either we build more facilities and that funding is not going to come out of the air. That funding has to come mainly from the state and some from the city. So really it falls on elected officials. Uh, or, or to do what you're doing right now, which is basically to try to accom accommodate and have, just like you run classrooms and you, you know, rotate classes, uh, that you could rotate on it. And, and what I hear is that you, you're going with the second option. I wanted to ask you one more question because I know this is pressing uh, here is regarding the Morales and Shakur community. I, I had an opportunity to go there a couple of years ago. I remember we took a tour and there was discussions back then of the possibility of, of, of moving, if I, if I recall uh, right even back then. Uh, according to DNA Info, uh, City College offers students a uh, former firehouse. Do you know anything about that? And if so, the, uh, what's the feedback that you have received from students? Or is that just a rumor that, like often happens in the media, I end up in DNA Info <laughs> or any other media? Yeah, I don't, I don't know about uh, oh, any yeah. student feedback on that. No? no. Okay. No. So. The, the accommodation, just to be clear, that was made for them, for the students, for that community space, they end up going where? I'm not, I'm not sure where they went. Uh, the space, I know. No, no, the space, obviously, is in the space. What's in there now? I believe it's career, I believe it's career services. Okay, and then the students were told they could meet where now? Does anybody here in CUNY know. have that info? The CNY representative in terms of students. Uh, to that point, is there someone from CCNY, CCNY who's on the administration who can participate and address that issue? You have to come okay, to the mic, to please, come. and identify yourself. And please identify yourself. I'd like to swear you in, and then you can offer whatever it is you can share with us. Uh, my name is Wendy Thornton. Okay, would you raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to answer questions truthfully? Yes. Good. Can you give us your name and your title, please? Wendy Thornton, Dean for Student Development, City College. Okay. So, so if you could answer the question, uh, where, where, where did the students end up meeting at? What happens is student clubs and organizations go through the uh, reservation process through the Department of Student, Office of Student Life and Leadership Development. So they would go through uh, application process, request to use space on campus like any other student organization on campus, and they're granted space that way. So, so I have two questions related to that. One, were they not of, I'm sure they knew, but what, since they had to be moved out, uh, were they notified that they have to reapply? With the that process is ongoing, so you can always apply for space that way. Okay, so, so how many of the groups that were meeting there reapply? I can't answer that question. I, I don't know. Okay. Because that wasn't designated as club space. So all of our clubs and organizations go through the reservation process to request to use space on campus. But you, I just want to clarify, but mm -hmm. you knew who was meeting there. Um... I know that Sir would have meetings there. Is that is that the is that the only group that that I'm aware of? Okay, so for example, students for education arrive, Black Student mm -hmm. Union, Community Vision Council, the Universal Sulu Nation, Nosotros los Pobres, New Black Panther Party, Radical Woman. Uh, groups like that, where, where are they meeting right now? I'm not sure. They would have to go through the reservation process. So that goes through student life. So if they want to meet on campus, they can. They just have to go through the reservation process like any other student club or organization to request a space and to get 
into the space. Were, were they were they were there uh, conversations that took place with these groups that were running out of there? Not that I was involved in, so I'm not aware of that. But again, I, I know it's confusing, but I want to yes, be clear that the process for all student clubs and organizations to use space on campus, because we don't have space to give students club space, so they don't have their own individual spaces, no, unlike hostels. I, I hear you, and look, they, I, I'm a fan of q and &E. Everybody knows mm -hmm. that I'm very public and very supportive. I, I'm just trying to get clarity here mm -hmm. because they've been there since 1990, so they're not a nuclear in the block. They, they, they have history. Mm -hmm. And so I just, you know, process matters to me and right. how things are go about. I'm not even, I, I, I'm not even qualified, to be honest with you, to, to tell you whether it was a right or wrong decision. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is internal. It's something that the student body with administration right. has. To, but process matters to me. And I'm just curious as to there were discussions because everybody knew that there were going to be um, you know, people who were going to students who were going to be dissatisfied, people who were, you know, mm -hmm. alumni and so forth. So, yes, go ahead. The question you're answer asking me, I can't answer because I wasn't involved in the process. I so see. I'm just giving you the process for what students can do to obtain space on campus. And so would all, all of the groups, if they were to apply, mm -hmm. uh, all of the groups will be accommodated? We try to accommodate them as best we can because there's, we have an events committee as well, a reservations committee. So as long as space is available and they do it in a timely fashion, they're able to get into the space. But as we, it was discussed here earlier, there's not enough space on campus to accommodate everyone. We have 179 clubs wow. on our campus. You have 179 yes. clubs? Yes. How many classrooms do you have? Oh, I couldn't tell you that. I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know. But we have How, lots of what's classrooms. What's the rate of denial? Ooh, I don't know that. I think pretty much most students that ask for space, as long as it's available, they can get it, unless something else is going on in a space. Right. But we try to accommodate them as best we can, so I think that we do a fairly good job at that. How many weeks in advance do they have to normally? We'd like to do it a month in advance, but we'll go up to two weeks in advance as well, because sometimes students don't know, so they'll come to us and say they'd like to use the space, and so we accommodate them. Okay. Have, I'm <laughs> just curious. At, uh, the atmosphere of the college? Has there been protests or anything related to this? There were protests when uh, this first happened, but there haven't been many since then. I think there might have been another one, a uh, small one. Okay. Have any clubs died as a result of not being able to meet there? No, not that I'm aware of. Okay. All righty. Well, I, I uh, thank you so much for the answer. I would love uh, to get the answers to the questions that uh, you can honestly say I don't have the mm -hmm. answers mm -hmm. to, but if you could give me okay. that information, because process is important to me. I, I, I get 179 clubs. It's a lot of clubs, um, and I know accommodations uh, uh, need to be made, and, and I know in, in CUNY's this is an important piece mm -hmm. uh, that needs to take place. So, you know, I'm, I'm really supportive of both camps. You right. know, we want the student life, and at the same time, you have to uh, you know, you know, make adjustments and accommodations. But at the end of the day, I have to say it again, I'll make a loud, you know, the sound of the trumpet here. We have to do, in government, we have to do a better job in providing you the funding. We have a $3 billion overflow of funding here last year. My Lord, you know, we, we need to we need mm -hmm. to redirect some of this funding. We talk about education is the most important thing. I was a college professor, you know, I, I, I get it. I mean, this to me, this is like vital. Uh, and it's one of the things is one of my biggest pet peeves that we say do this, but we don't give you the resources. We should be pouring uh, millions and millions of dollars to make sure that all of our campuses, which have plenty of land, some of them, not all of them, but some of them got 50 acres worth of land and so forth, and those campuses, we can at least do something, and that requires money, and that has to come from government, and that's why people pay taxes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, before you leave, Ms. Thornton, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, thank you, Council Member, for your questions, and I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Lori Cumbo as well. 
Um, in, in response to the questions that my colleague has asked that we can get um, a response to, if you would include your understanding of how that center was established, what was the memorandum of understanding that came out of that mm -hmm. establishment, and what were the, uh, I believe it was some kind of legal process involved in resolving a uh, crisis that existed at that time. So if you could include that in your response okay. to the questions that were raised, I would appreciate that. No because it seems like um, no one has that firm, definitive answer for us. Okay. And we need to see how we can uh, understand what came about, mm -hmm. what has been sometimes described as an illegal closure mm -hmm. without having any due process. And we want to certainly not come to a situation where students now make this the issue that they want to uh, mimic what's going on in Missouri. So we were, certainly want to have dialogue, okay. because it seems it has not been effective dialogue to understand what's going on so that people can, as my colleague has been said, we need to know what were the facts, right. what is the process, so that we can understand that we're not being disrespected or pushed to the side or marginalized and not being responded to. Okay, we appreciate that. Okay. And uh, just in conclusion to the panel, we, you, we've kept you for quite some time. We do appreciate your presentations. And if you could uh, answer one other question, are you a member of the Association of College Unions International? Is CUNY a member or are the schools individually members? I don't believe we are centrally because uh, not, not all of our colleges have uh, unions. Some of our individual colleges may be members. I don't know if no, we're not. We're, we are not. So okay. Lehman is not. Okay, and uh, so is it my understanding that every campus does in fact have a dedicated office space for student government? That's my understanding. Okay. I, I'll double check for okay, you on that. Okay, appreciate I'm, that. I'm fairly certain. And um, child care is underway. Well, the constructions, the plans, and it's going to be Everything's open. Underway, right. And I would like for you to please let me know what happened to those students, the children that were there, we and if we can find a way to track them so that they don't get lost. And in terms of finally, um, the dedicated space that does exist, if you could, some, I know that CUNY has so much to do, but CUNY has so much talent and many resources that perhaps you can get me the answer to the question is, what amount of space does exist at each campus for dedicated space reserved for student governments, also the open space that you talked about? I'd like to get an idea of what percentage of all of the footage, square footage in, in CUNY is being dedicated. We're talking about it's so crowded, it's so crowded. We're, okay, I understand that, I acknowledge that. What percentage of the space is actually reserved for students? So if you could somehow get that information to me, I know I won't have it you know, tomorrow or next week or next month, but if you can get it to me when you do accumulate it, I would appreciate that. We will do that for you. Okay, great. And lastly, I don't think that social media is going to ever replace the need for people to come together, dialogue, face to face, look at each other, uh, debate, come to some consensus and make plans for long range that would affect what's going on. But thank you so much for your testimony. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Good. And as they're leaving, we're going to call the next panel. Uh, Shepard McDaniel from the Universal Zulu Nation of the Morales Shakur Center, Professor James Blake from BMCC, uh, Alicia Orsira from hmm? Osorio, okay, from the Morales Shakur Center, and oh boy, I need help with this one. Jesenia, oh that's a J. Jesenia Venegas, come please. Oh. Announce like a joke. Yeah. Good afternoon. If you would raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to answer all questions honestly? Yes. I do. Thank you. You may begin. Uh, 
afternoon. Need the mic. Uh, first, I'd like to thank. Uh, Could Councilman. you get a little closer to the mic? Oh. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Give us your name, please. My name is Shepard McDaniel, and I'm here representing the Universal Zulu Nation and also the coordinator for the Guillermo Morales Asada Shakur Faculty, Alumni, and Legal Committee. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Council Minute Member Ines Barron and the rest of the Council meeting uh, members here for um, conducting this hearing. And it's been long coming, and I'm really glad that this has taken place. Um, in 1969, student strikes opened up the doors for blacks, Latinos, and other oppressed people in CUNY. Um, those strikes not only cleared the way for those for the people I mentioned to finally, finally gain full interest into CUNY via the historically biased white preferred policy of free tuition and open admissions, but it also initiated the creation of black studies, Latino studies, Asian studies, women's studies, Jewish studies, and the securing of on-campus spaces that were needed to organize and protect those academic departments in general and overall student rights in particular. During the mid 70s, when I myself benefited from this earlier student struggle as a student leader for the Black Student Union at Hunter College at CUNY, not only was um, the two largest but arguably the top Black, Africana, and Latino Studies Department in the United States in both Hunter and, and City College. But more importantly, the Black Student Union held offices where actually we had two spaces. We had one at the Theodore and Eleanor Roosevelt House, um, which was off campus. And we also had one on campus that was given to us by the Department of Black and Puerto Rican Studies so that we would be able to function on the campus with the students. Um, having the largest membership, of course, we had the largest budget. so. Uh, we were able to do a lot of things at Hunter during that time. We built a hospital in Mozambique. We saved the Scharenberg Center when it was going to be sold to West Germany. We provided clothing, supplies to the refugees in South Africa during the whole apartheid struggle. We shut down Ipitambi and the Kugaran campaigns that were also related to um, South Africa. Dignitaries and even heads of state visited CUNY on a regular basis and were hosted at student spaces. When Roots came out, the Alex Haley movie, um, ABC and the media came to Hunter College and to City College to interview the students there based on our expertise as being students of black and Puerto Rican studies and history, and particularly with the professors that we had that were teaching there. We had prison programs at Greenhaven Okay, where families were able to go to the prisons with students and faculty and work on different issues that took place, dealing with family issues. Our dances and parties were well known all throughout CUNY during those times, but the whole point is that they served the community. Any funds that were raised went into community programs such as Hale House and other institutions in Harlem primarily. XG, um, student government elections. Hunter was the first one to have a black slate and a black student government. Um, we revealed a lot of um, inappropriate behavior that took place back then. And since then, there's been um, equal distribution of uh, representation as far as student government is concerned. Unfortunately, all those documents, and uh, this is really important to me because it came up at this hearing, all of our documents disappeared. So all that history, except for people who held on to individual records, they all disappeared from the campus at both of our offices in the early 80s. We're going to fast forward to 1989, the student strike that took place then. As was mentioned here already, from 1990 to 2013, the Guillermo Morales Asada Shakur Community and Student Center at City College existed. Repeatedly attacked by administration during that time. Um, there were lawsuits, a number of them that took place, um, including the illegal bugging of the office by administration and security, um, students being threatened 
Um, there was also the closing of the Finley Student Center, which was a building that was provided for students. Um, that's really, again, important because back when I was in school, the whole second floor of, of Hunter College um, High School was for students, the whole second floor. So students had those classrooms utilized for their clubs. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, downstairs on the first floor, the Department of Black and Puerto Rican Studies provided Caribbean Student Union, Black Student Union, and Puerto Rican United with spaces right there in the department offices. So there was space back then. The Messenger came out of the Miles Cross Center. It was a newspaper that was produced by students to deal with issues and situations that affected black, Latino, and poor um, communities and different political issues that affected us throughout the world. We held field forums, speakers came to the center. We had workshops. Um, the People's Survival Program was based in the Morales Shakur Center, providing free clothes, hot meals, and emergency services to the community. Um, it's very important that people understand this was a community and student center. It was purposely done that way because City College is in Harlem. I don't care what you want to call it. You can call it Morningside Heights or whatever you want. It's in Harlem. When Sandy hit, we were the first ones on the ground in Red Hook, in Coney Island, and in Far Rockaway. We organized from that center to provide hot meals, supplies, and things were brought there to be able to give out to the community. We had two large caravans that went out to those locations before FEMA, before the Red Cross. Students and community from City College were there to help serve the people. We had a food co-op that functioned at the Morales Shakur Center. The WBAI radio station, which was actually uh, granted permission to broadcast out of CCNY recently, also had their elections at the Morales Shakur Center. We had a student book exchange where students could be able to trade in their books and get other books instead of paying those crazy prices that they charge you in the bookstores. <laughs> we had a computer and study lab inside the center. The Gen I Make um, University for Youth function out of the Morales Shakur Center on weekends where young children from the community were able to come and learn about their history and their culture and participate in trips such as the um, Museum of Natural History, Museum of Art, and different locations throughout the city where they were um, given that information on history that they normally don't get in regular schools. We had free Spanish to English classes particularly in the area that's so-called known as Washington Heights, which I still call Northwest Harlem, <laughs> okay, um, they were able to come into City College and learn English for free, as everything else was for free. Right there in Morale Shakur Center, we function that program there. We were about to launch a free medical clinic in the Morale Shakur Center on Sundays in cooperation with IFCO. Uh, if people know IFCO, that's the interfaith um, community organization that sends regularly caravans to Cuba. But more importantly, they train students to go to Cuba and learn medicine for free, become doctors. Those doctors are required to bring their, uh, their um, talents back to the community. It was all set up. On Sundays, they were going to open up you know, a clinic for, you know, to refer and so forth at the Morales Shakur Center. And as I mentioned with Hunter College, Many dignitaries were in the Morales Shakur Center from Cuba, Venezuela, Ghana, Angola, Zimbabwe, on and on and on. Okay. It functioned as a place to um, serve as receptions for these dignitaries that came into CUNY. Once again, giving um, CCNY an elevated um, presence in New York City. Today, after all the legal battles that I mentioned, the bugging and the student threats and on and on and on, um, the Morales Shakur Center was shut down and like its namesakes, Guillermo Morales and Asaj Shakur who also were students at CUNY and were actually, the students decided to name the center after them because they were involved in that early 1969 student strike to allow most of the students to be able to come and attend CUNY. In conclusion, I just want to say that um, we will continue to get the center back, and I really hope that the council here will be able to get the answers to the questions that I have heard 
today, which are very important. Um, there was no process, and uh, the students here will be able to elaborate more on that. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alyssa Osorio. I'm a student organizer at the City College of New York. I was the former director of the Guillermo Morales Asada Shakur Student and Community Center, and I was also, at the time the center was removed, president of Students for Educational Rights, an organization that was mentioned before um, we held the lease for the center. And the center was a safe space for many working class students of color working on issues the university and the community were facing. The center was taken away in October of 2013 with no clear communication from administration the, or the board of trustees about the situation. They refused to e even acknowledge the space was a community center, calling it NAC 3201. The school has to this day still been unclear about the location of some of the property within the center. There has been no accountability to the students and community that City College has destroyed. Not really destroyed, we're still moving on, but without our space. Since the center has been taken away, the campus climate has changed drastically. Administration does not hold open meetings with the students anymore. When they schedule meetings with concerned students, they end up skipping the meetings for other events on campus and they don't meet with us. They'll just go make a lecture and then go into their chauffeured cars. Um, scheduling events is a nightmare <laughs> and students must be approved through a board consisting of administration, public safety, and our office of student life. This sometimes take, takes weeks, oftentimes not even happening at all. Administration takes an active role in stifling student leadership due to its constant fear of dissent. At 2 p.m. today, the administration and faculty at City College will be discussing our public safety officers having arms. This is something we organized against in the Morales Shakur Center, believing the presence of guns normalizes the violence they perpetuate. Guns have no place in an educational setting, especially in a setting known for actively disregarding the safety of students. Students were not invited to be part of this conversation, though this is a huge decision that would affect us. The numerous resources we have won as activists within the school are being taken away. Free printing, extended lab hours, our child care center, and much more. Our professors who have been fighting for a contract for six years are also going to schools with completely crumbling infrastructure. The st students need more resources, not less, and we don't need excuses onto why we don't have the resources we're entitled to. The Morales Shakur Center was a space where we could be in control of these problems. We could think, plan, strategize. The center was a space where we held discussions on issues like gender violence on campus, where we began to confront it, where we began to heal. The community organizations in the center fed people, did know your rights trainings, actively reduced the harm that has been happening through, throughout many communities within the city and within our own city college. The students in the center won campaigns. We learned how to be leaders. We pulled resources to provide scholarships and services. We absolutely 100% need space that is completely autonomous from the college administration. City college administration has been even responsive to calls for a meeting from city council. I sat in a room where my college president left the room after a 10 minute meeting with the chair of this committee and I was ashamed. If there is no space for students to organize, how can we confront this? How can we build awareness? And something I'd like to speak to a little bit is the child care center that was aforementioned. I'm friends with some of the parents who were in the college and they have either left the college because they could not find child care or they have spoken about how the subsidies offered to the parents were not enough to even cover basic minimum for child care. If City College comes up with this, I mean, they're not here right now, but if City College can come up with a, track, a way of tracking the parents, there will be concrete evidence as to how City College has failed student pa parents within the university. But thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Jasenia Venegas and I'm a recent graduate from the City College of New York and I'm also a core creator and core member of the Sister Circle Collective. Uh, I'm here today because I want to tell you about my experience in college and how the Morales Shakur Student Community Center uh, as an autonomous space impacted my experience there. Um, in 2012 I took a transnational feminisms class uh, with Dr. Griselda Rodriguez and I learned about 
transnational feminism and intersectionality. And in the same year, I also became a part of the Malasha Core Center, and I was there very often. And it was there that I was able to see this intersectionality play out, not just in books, but in real life. There was a variety of uses for that space, which is something that they mentioned before about multifaceted spaces. You know, they had book drives, they had uh, food drives, food justice, learn your rights training, uh, among other things. So that was a very multifaceted use of space. All you had to do to reserve it was to check the calendar that was on the wall. If there was nobody there that day, then you could reserve it. And there was no bureaucratic process. There was no one really having to approve it. It was very, very easy, unlike how it is now. This space became important to me, particularly um, as me and a group of women created the Sister, Sister Circle Collective in response to so much uh, sexual violence going on in our college campuses and around our communities. So we began to organize, and a lot of our organization was in this space um, because there was a complete lack of resources for those kind of issues, sexual violence issues, gender issues on our campus. We decided to uh, begin a gender resource center campaign, um, which was organized out of the Malasha Core Center along with SCR, or Students for Educational Rights. So. The need of autonomous spaces is extremely important because we as students don't just need our voices heard and ideas heard, but we need a space to manifest those ideas, a space to organize. So it's not just about also being heard, it's about doing things, and spaces allow that to happen. Um, the reason why we need full autonomy uh, is because, for example, the Marshall Core Center, it was an autonomous space. We didn't have to go through any process to really reserve the space. And it was taken away without any consent, without any conversation, without any process whatsoever. Um, when that happens, it shows us the administration had no respect, understanding, or care for any of the issues, any of the work, any of the organizing going on in that space. So it makes me wonder if we had to go through any uh, approval process for events, then what? what why would they? Uh, you know, approve that, which is what we have experienced on campus now, where various groups who were in the Morales Shakur Center who have tried to get space on campus have been denied repeatedly. So the autonomy of a space for students is extremely important because that approval process isn't necessary. So if the administration does not agree with an opinion or a political outlook or an event, then the event can go on without, without any uh, anyone getting in the way and that's really important and that's why we need autonomous spaces on City College um, so um, I think the Morales Shakur Center is a, a perfect example of why those autonomous spaces are needed because if it's not in the interest of the administration of the college campus or of the CUNY wide campus then it's not going to happen and if there are no spaces where students can voice their ideas and if there's not an autonomous space where the colleges can give the students and it shows that there is no trust in the students and there is no real respect or even care for those ideas that the student themselves are bringing upon and the community that surrounds that college is bringing into the school. And I think that's why that's important. Good afternoon, uh, Councilman uh, Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee. Uh, my name is uh, Professor James Blake, and I am a faculty member at the Borough of Manhattan Community College. Uh, I was here earlier on another issue, uh, which I hope this uh, council will eventually take up, and that's students being attacked, student leaders being attacked on campuses. Uh, however, I had to take a day off because I lost, last night I lost a very close family member, but I promised the students that I would be at City Hall with them today and support them in their efforts to fight uh, against oppression. I am so happy that this meeting was called on, on space. Uh, I didn't plan to stay here that long, but I just could not walk out knowing that this was topic was going to be discussed and how important it is, at least uh, at Borough Manhattan Community College. I came to that college in 1970. I've been there for 45 years, 1970. And when I got to BMCC, we had the A building, the B building, the C building, the D building, the H building, the M building. And we had, and the D building was right next to a place called the Tango Palace. And some students used to go in there thinking they're going to class. We were hungry 
for space. We were desperate for space. We marched, we demonstrated, we wrote letters to elected officials, uh, we, we talked to folks in the community, we mobilized, we organized, we walked from 50th Street all the way downtown to Chambers Street, chanting, we need a building, a decent place for us to have an education for our children, our students. We finally were successful. Borough Manhattan Community College was built. And I can tell you from my perspective and many people at that time, it was a dream. We had a swimming pool. We had a gymnasium. We had theaters. And I'm using had now, and I'm not just saying that just to be saying that. We had theaters. We had student lounge. And we had spaces where students could communicate and talk to each other in what they call the open space. Shortly after the arrival of the current administration, the physical education department was closed. Students would take courses in phys physical ed, one credit course, and it enabled them to, especially if they were facing remedial needs, they were able to get one credit and plus another two credit in order to maintain their TAP and not lose their financial aid. So taking away the physical education courses not only was detrimental to the students physically, but it was also detrimental to the students financially because they could no longer, because of remedial needs, pick up a, a non-remedial course to uh, satisfy their financial aid. Those one credit courses were absolutely essential. The swimming pool is no longer there. When it was there, it was being utilized and rented out to the community. And the students would walk past the swimming pool because it's a glass enclosure and you can look right down at this beautiful Olympic pool and what they saw was people who looked, that did not look anything like them. Swimming and learning lessons and how to swim, et cetera. They were from the community. The same thing with the uh, uh, gymnasium. The gymnasium was rented out. So the classes that students would take in a physical education course in the gym, you know, aerobics and exercise and things of that nature were no longer credited. That was removed as well. The theaters, oh boy, we were happy to have a theater because we used to have our performances in a lounge that was noisy. The theaters are now, uh, a, the students have access to them, but the students have to pay so much from their student activity fee in order to utilize the theaters. They have to pay a technology fee. They have to pay, uh, 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 they don't rent the theaters, but all of the, the security, if they have an event, they have to pay security. Security guards who are already working at the college. They're paying them uh, out of student activity fee. Uh, and and, and it's, it becomes very difficult for clubs and organizations to meet the, 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 that expense because it's not, it's not uh, cheap. It's very, very expensive. Uh, the, our international students. Our international students, if we go to Borough Manhattan community, they bring $7 million a year to the college. $7 million, cash money. They get no financial aid or anything of that nature. They're international students. If you go to the college right now and you look for the international students' office, the space is practically in the basement. It's dingy, it's crowded and congested, and it really is not something that, you know, uh, given the, the resources that that group brings to the college, that they should have a better, better space than that. Uh, I see this space issue for BMCC, I can't speak for the other campus, it's this tension between profit and, and, and what's good for the students and what's good for profit. Uh, and, and from what our experience has been is that the profit motive has taken priority over student needs. And when the past panel said that every building is built for the students, that just simply I take issue with that. The buildings might be built for the students, but they do not remain uh, 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 for students to utilize and, and, and to grow intellectually, et cetera, in. Uh, the latest thing that concerned me is that there is a proposal, I understand, that's floating around uh, 
uh, the college come and emanating from the president is that they want to build luxury condos over BMCC. They want to build luxury condos over BMCC because the air rights, you know, BMCC is in an area where it's hot real estate. It's, 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 it's expensive, you know, it's, it's, you know, and this, to sell the air rights would be a lot of money, a lot of profit for the college and for the university. And so there are plans to build, uh, 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 or at least a proposal to build a, 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 a condo, a luxury condo, dump, uh, uh, not dump, but Trump, <laughs> like, uh, me, I didn't mean to say that. Uh, Trump-like condos, you know, over BMCC. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I can give you this, the latest uh, uh, record that comes from Tribeca where they're discussing this whole issue. If our space is being taken over and we're in a kind of like an old building now, if we're losing all of our auxiliary space, what do you think is going to happen if they build luxury condos? We might just lose the entire college. They're talking about the possibility of moving the college up to the old Penn State building. There's some discussion about doing that, about moving us out. You know, we're in a community where diversity is thriving. I mean, people from every class, every color, every, everybody, you know, and they want to move a significant portion of people of color out of that area, build luxury condos, and move us up closer to some other place in Manhattan. So my, my, testimony is that when it comes to space and like student space, the students at my school, the student government at my school uh, was threatened with having their space move, or not move, but change, so they would have no privacy. They wanted just a glass enclosed, glass enclosed space where students would hold their meetings and, and everybody can see what they're doing. There was no really uh, uh, privacy and they say, well, we'll give you a space someplace outside of student government to conduct your privacy. Well, you know, th that's just not fair. And they, when they did it and the students rose up against it and decided that they didn't want that to happen, you know, they ran into difficulty with the administration. So uh, as a faculty advisor uh, for many years to student government and being at that college and know the history, have institutional history, I really take issue with the uh, statement that every building is built for students. Uh, I want to thank the panel for their testimony, and I do have some questions. And my colleague also will have some questions uh, for you. In terms of, uh, you said that the Students for Educational Rights held the lease. Can you tell me what the terms of the lease were? So the terms of the lease were that as long as Students for Educational Rights was a club that we would hold space in the center. Unfortunately, those documents are in our files, which were seized. But when the budget cut protests happened, they made a contract with the CUNY board and the Student Services Corporation in order for the Morales Shakur Center to exist and wait can you say that again because I, I'm, I'm not clear okay the CUNY Board of Trustees right. you said that uh, the terms of the lease were that as long as you were a club yes as long as students for educational rights was a registered club mm -hmm. and an active club which we were at the time that the center was seized we mm -hmm. had a functioning e-board we had the right amount of members we registered to be a club and were approved that we would be able to keep the space okay and then you were saying something Yes, that? and that was chartered through the CUNY Board of Trustees and the Student Services Corporation. So the signatories on that lease were the CUNY Board of Trustees and? The Student Services Corporation. SDR. And I think they changed names throughout the years. Um, not the Board of Trustees, but the Student Services Corporation. And so you don't have a copy of that agreement? I do not. No, mm -hmm. I've been waiting for a copy of that agreement and um, the school, of course, will not provide it to me because they know that if I have it. it so no one else has a copy other than, is, I, is, it, yeah. is it registered someplace in minutes that may have occurred at some meeting 
Yes. So I have a copy of one of the lawsuits that explains that like Students for Educational Rights was in charge of the space. And then I have some of the details from the lawsuit. And so what's the status of the lawsuit? Is it still? It was dropped. So it wasn't a lawsuit about what happened in November. It was a lawsuit about the name of the space. The college was displeased with the alumni that we chose to name the space after. So who brought the lawsuit? Um, I think it was City College. OK. So they brought a lawsuit. Uh, you want to clarify? Because yes. I want to be please. clear. Yes. Um, Can you speak into the mic, please? Yes, um, you know, myself, you know, coming in at, and being appointed as the chair of the center, um, I was um, given all that information in terms of the history and the whole sign issue. The sign was removed and actually was part of a couple of lawsuits. One was dealing with um, free speech. Uh, certain students were um, threatened with um, being expelled and so forth. So our council for our board of directors at that time, um, they sued City College. Okay. Okay, for that whole uh, First Amendment rights um, violation, which included the sign that okay. was taken down by, by force. There was an additional lawsuit that went on about. So before you go to the additional okay. one, what happened with that one? Um, it was lost. <laughs> okay, you lost. Okay. Yeah. They, we didn't have the money <laughs> okay. to continue the lawsuit. All right. And then you said there was an additional one? The additional one was dealing with the um, bug that was put in the smoke detector in the office, which was located right below the security office. And the outcome with that? That one was also, uh, it was sort of said that, you know, the school was in violation, but they weren't, there was no punitive um, actions taken at all with that. Uh, what I will say is our attorney at that time, the lead attorney, Ron McGuire, um, um, he, sh he should have those documents that we're looking for. Okay. Um, but um, we did inspect our file cabinets. We did finally get around to doing that. Since the material, since the since, space since has been closed. Correct. And it's been, okay, so you did inspect your... Yes, we did okay. inspect, and a number of things were missing. Um, files were put in different areas, and, you know, we did do an inventory and a checklist of what we saw was missing what it wasn't. So uh, just basically everything that was organized in that office is now disorganized in the warehouse that is currently being held in. Okay. And can you speak to the organizations that were listed as part of the community organizations that worked out of that space as well? You talked about some of the services that they provided. Can you speak to where these, the other panel didn't have any information as to what became of these organizations. Do you know of what happened? Um, as far as the student organizations, I think um, Alyssa would be better suited to that. To mm -hmm. best of my knowledge, the Black Student Union is still functioning on campus. Uh -huh. um, SER is still functioning on campus. Okay. Um, I don't know of the others. A lot of them are no longer were able to exist because when the center left, they didn't have any place to, like radical women, they had to leave. Um, you know, a lot of folks had to leave because there was no place to meet, so they went to other locations. Um, as far as the community groups are concerned, um, still existing is, you know, represent, you know, the organization I represent, Universal Zulu Nation, is still in existence. Um, the Black Soldiers is still in existence. The New Black Panther Party sort of is in existence. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if the food co-op is still around, CVC. Um, the food co-op has Can you speak into the oh. mic, please? The food co-op has been moved to outside of City College, so it's a little bit more uptown. Um, um yeah, I'm going through recollection, <laughs> trying to remember all the organizations. At one point, we had almost 20 organizations functioning at that center. Mm -hmm. um, would you like me to still try to recall? <laughs> Well, no, that's okay. I don't <laughs> okay. want to press the point. I can speak to the student organizations that have now turned into, some of them have turned into community organizations oh, okay. out of the center. So student, so a lot of the student organizations are still functioning, but at diminished capacity. So 
Something that has been happening is when we ask for meeting space, we won't get an email back confirming that we asked. And when we register for club, like our club budgets, we don't get approved for any budget. So you can't host an event at certain times because you have to pay for public safety to be there to have your event. Um, and for Students for Educational Rights, we are still active on campus and would love it if City Council, anyone from City Council would take a tour with us so we can show you what's really happening at City. Um, Sister Circle Collective is still functioning. Uh, Black Student Union is still functioning. And the, there was an environmental group out of the camp, out of the center that is not functioning anymore. So a lot of the campaign-based organizing is where we lost power. So with the Gender Resource Center campaign, where we're trying to get a resource center for victims of sexual violence or survivors of sexual harassment, they, um, we have had a lot of trouble staying cohesive because we don't have a safe, like, the same space to meet in and we can't yeah. reserve, or it's very, very, very difficult to reserve club space. Okay. So we normally take empty classrooms or like meet in the cafeteria or if there's space somewhere. Okay. And oftentimes in the student lounges, which is something I like to bring up, is we talk about these student lounges in these libraries. They are very crowded, very, very, very crowded. And it's very difficult to even have a study group with your friends, let alone a club meeting there. Okay, I'm um, going to... Just before I um, go to my colleague, I'm going to one ask one can quick I just question. Add real Wait, let quick? me just ask oh, okay. one question. You, you made uh, your second reference about sexual violence and harassment on campus. Is that what you said? Yes. That, as you may know, is a very serious issue. And uh, I wanted to find out do you feel, do you think that there's been any improvement or is it still an issue? How has that been handled? We talked about it. Yes. We went to city and we talked about it. So what can you say has happened to address that issue? And do you feel that it has resulted in improved conditions? City College administration to this day has not sit down with the organizers of this campaign, which I think is unacceptable. What City College has done is they've hired two counselors to deal with the issue, which wasn't one of our demands. And on this committee, they specifically found students who are not affiliated with the campaign, so students in Veterans Affairs and a student from uh, the Wellness Center who was unaffiliated with the campaign. Um, and they will cite that as an improvement, but we have been asking for counselors who are well-versed in issues of gender, race, sexuality, because the counselors at City College, even though they're great, they're overburdened and can also not do that research. We need someone coming in with that analysis. And they've said that they will not, administration has said that they will absolutely not offer us an autonomous space to do the work that we are proposing. I think, honestly, the campus feels more unsafe to me because there has been more public safety officers on campus who are not well trained in anti-harassment and I see a lot of posters by administration but the posters do not identify clear pathways for where you want to go so if you do not want to report to the police it's not clear where you that's stand. not clear that's not clear okay well oh, I want to talk to you further about that because I'm, I'm sure the CUNY uh, would say that that's not what they have adopted as their policy, so yeah. I'll talk further. But I do want to sure. uh, yield to my colleague, Cong uh, Council Member Idanis Rodriguez. Thank you. First of all, thank you for all the students who are here and to the member of the panels. You know, I can say that listening to all of you take me back to those years because I was one of those students who negotiated with the administration after we took over in 1989 uh, the NAC building as one of the first, as one of the many uh, takeovers that took place among CUNY, fighting against to issue increase in budget cuts. So we always fight, especially or compete, students from City College and Hunter College, or who was leading the movement, but City College always won. 
even though in solidarity we were very close. You know, we slam uh, Hunter College and the student for education right at City College and student throughout K K CUNY and, and Queens and Brooklyn. Uh, reality is that thanks to President Halstern, after we took over 1989, he agreed in the administration to allow the students to use NAC 3201 that used to be used as a student lounge to, to convey that, as a, to use that, that room as a, a student and community center. In the 90s, we got a 27,000 a, a grant for auxiliary enterprise so that we can purchase computers and other equipment a, as, a, as a student and community center for that particular room. I run a pre-university program from that location uh, where I have more than 300 students every Saturday in a leadership program Fridays. Uh, Besides, I can say, I can testify that uh, when the Persian Gulf 1991, it was from that room that the student movement was organized, many marched in the street, and then uh, in the invasion also in Iraq, uh, that room played a major role, being you uh, in a peaceful manner, organized a, a student and communities. So many groups from Latinos, African Americans, Asian, white, came together. And that room since 1989 to the moment when the administration changed the purpose of that room, it uh, was used mainly for a peaceful organizing support and uh, resources for the students and the community. Uh, I, as a former chairman of this committee, uh, that I also had the honor to chair for four years, we did a tour with the administration. Uh, we walked to the room. I asked the administration to please restore NAC 3201 as a student and community center. We can agree or disagree with the name. Uh, but for me, it's about the purpose of the center. Uh, the center, NAC 3201, has a history of bringing many student community group uh, used for different purposes. Most of them, again, supporting students uh, uh, to be organized as a, a anti-war, uh, organized the anti-war movement. And no doubt that uh, those two locations uh, the student for education right at NAC 301 and the slam at Hunter College play a major role in the 90s and the 2000s. So I just hope that again, that especially now we understand that New York City is in, you know, has to be in alert, that we need to be sure that any use of facility that we have in our society is in a peaceful way, manner, that's the purpose of the room. And I just hope that the administration and I advocate in, in the year that I served as a chairman and now as a member of this committee, I still have a hope that the administration, CUNY, and us can come together with a plan on how to restore NAC 3201 as a student and community center. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, council member. So what was your understanding then of the reason that it was closed. What did, when you, you spoke with the president, can you share what was said for the reason that it was closed and the response that you may have gotten when you asked that it be restored? Two or one became a target. I can say that, you know, at the age of 50, and I hope to be one of those individuals that I still, if I'm allowed to live a couple of years, can say that, you know, life is not about what we have done is be sure that we dedicate the whole life, you know, fighting for social justice. So I've been a witness of everything that you have described. We are the one who started the book exchange program. We are the one, I was the one who ran the pre-university program. And I had to thank Wendy Thornton, who was here too, because during those years, not only we, we were able to use the 3201, but the administration also through the auxiliary enterprise uh, provide grant to us. We were able to buy the computers. We also were running the papers, which also was run from 3201. 
We also got funding to open in a student center in the first floor. And again, in my recollection, after we ended the takeover, and there's a great article that I was looking at it in, is in the New York Times, May 2, 1989, it was, that talk about that student takeover that I started at City College and continuing spreading through the whole CUNY. And I gotta say that without that movement, because Murphy was the chancellor there, and, and central staff, you know, they will have a hard time with the budget cut that they went through and also the tuition increase. At that time, I believe tuition was $750, if I'm right in my, in my uh, memory. And, and they say there was a proposal to make a major increase. And even though we did not agree with the governor, because the governor wanted to come and meet with us, but today I would say I would go to meet at the church, uh, at Baptist Church at 145th and Convent. But you know, at that time we said, no, he had to come here. And of course he didn't come, he sent like 10 commissioners, and we met with them. Uh, but after we ended the takeover, there was an understanding bef between the administration led by Houston, the president of City College, and those of us who were leading the movement that 3201 will be used as a student and community center. Later on in the process, there were many occasions where we got funding from the auxiliary enterprise so that we can also bring more resources to continue to use that location as a student and community center. Again, when it comes to the name, it was later on that the proposal came. The room was renaming as a Chata, uh, Chata Chacul and Guillermo Morales. For me, I'm not married with the name. I just married with the purpose or the use of the room that I believe it was, it was, and it is in the intention of those who were there, though, that those are today, to use 321 for peaceful purpose, to continue organizing supporting the students, supporting members of the community, because that place was an important location for New York throughout the five borough to use as a center to organize, again, in the anti-war, from the peaceful movement, and also supporting each other for many uh, academic uh, plans. But it was given, again, from the administration as a student, community. it was an agreement between the president and us to use 321 as a center. So did the president give you a reason or rationale for terminating that agreement? It was a surprise. At that time, I was a chairman of, the high, of this committee. You know, what happened was right. I was... And so did, did, as a respect <coughs> to you as a chair, did they give you a reason or I an think, explanation? I think that for many years, uh, uh, for many years, unfortunately, you know, uh, City College, uh, and again, I'm not talking about the president, the current president list. I said for many years, they look at 3201 as a place where they wanted to get rid of us. You know, I was one of the students who also, uh, 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 when they put the smoke, the device inside the smoke detector, the whole thing was that supposedly they had information that we were planning another takeover. And, and for many months, I, at that time, I can say 98% of the use of that location at that time was for the pre-university program that I used to run. However, supposedly, they thought that we were planning a takeover. They put a device inside the smoke detector, something that was completely illegal. Of course, that they were able, CUNY was able to win because uh, the smoke detector was brought down. Uh, but I think that for, again, City College has been, in, in my personal experience, very supportive of the use that we have for that location for many years. But the way of how, you know, that 321 was shut down was not the best one. And again, I, I expressed before, and I believe today, that I hope that 321 is restored as a student and community center. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, back to the committee, I have a few other questions. The Professor Blake, you said there's no phys ed department? No, it's closed down. It's been down, closed down for more than uh, close to 10 years now. Okay. And 
students have to pay an activity <coughs> fee. In addition to whatever fees they pay, there's an additional cost to students to use space no, in the building? The, the student uh, are allocated so much for student government from the student activity fee. Right. And clubs are then allocated by student government right. for their club activities. Uh, and they have to use those funds uh, when they the use the theater. Okay. All right. Um, and, oh, having been at BMCC for so long, can you uh, talk to the question that I posed earlier about the original Fitterman Hall and how it's being used now in terms of continuation of the purposes for the space, and is it approximately the same as it was initially? But from, my, from my observation, it's, it's pretty much the same. Okay. Um, the only difference is that I believe the president has a presidential suite there and one at the college also. Oh, we could use that for student space. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I did ask for uh, some, uh, oh, I guess I need a more, a larger total picture then of how space is on the camp. Okay, that'll be a follow-up question. That's if you can get up there because it's restricted area. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and in terms of the uh, what you have said, you've heard maybe plans for the air rights over uh, BMCC. That is a part of this move in city government to build high, build luxury, and to um, give off or sell off our space to luxury developers. There's a plan also to do that same thing in Brooklyn mm -hmm. where the mm, library is located, mm -hmm. Cadman Plaza Library. They want to sell it, mm -hmm. allow the developer to take the library, remove the library, and build luxury condos on top of that space. Right. So it's a part of a larger Adam. movement of this capitalistic move to maximize profits uh, at all costs right. to make sure that yes. the profits for developers are right. realized. I did have some other questions. Um, but was there something else I had on the other thing? I think that will suffice for now. But I do want to thank you. Yes. Can we just add two things real quick? Get a mic, please. Two things real quick. Um, you mentioned organizations, and you know you caught me. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee was also a member and met there. We, um, went along with the Jericho Movement, we did um, political prisoner letter writings and birthday cards. You know, all the students would come and sign the cards and be able to teach them and let them be aware that there were political prisoners in the United States. Uh, also, um, the Revolutionary Students Organization existed. I don't know if they're still on campus anymore. Um, and of course, the People Power Movement, which was one of the founding groups, along with SCR from Mark Torres, who was also involved in that whole original takeover. And okay. Los Sotos, I don't know if they're around anymore. Maybe your daughters will know that <laughs> if they're still doing the classes. But I just wanted to add that in and put it on the record. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank the panel for coming and providing testimony and uh, invite you to stay in touch and participate in other hearings as they are announced and come up. We're going to call our third panel, final panel. Anna Paula White from Hunter College, CUNY Divest. Rajib Mia from CUNY Students. And I believe this is Russ Luf. Oh, Rudolph? Rudolph? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, from Kingsborough Community College. You can pronounce your name when you come up, so I don't mess it. Thanks. You can't call me Rudy. Well, when you pronounce it, I'm going to see if I can't master it. It shouldn't be too much of a problem. If you would raise your right hand, please. You need some more water. You'd raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to answer all questions honestly? Thank I you. Do. You may begin. Give us your name. Ladies first. Right? Yeah. In order. Um, unless you'd like to. No, go for it. All right. Hi. Um, 
My name is Anna Paula White. I just graduated from Hunter College with a degree in nursing. I was also the president of the Student Nurses Association of New York State, which is a, a hmm. segment of the, nursing, the National Student Nurses Association, um, which feeds into the American Nursing Association. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking today, so I don't actually have my testimony typed up, but when I heard some of the things um, that other administrators had to say about their campuses, I felt compelled to speak. Um, I was the vice president of my undergraduate student government at Hunter College for uh, about six months. I was on the University Student Senate at CUNY for uh, six months as a delegate, and then the next six months I spent on the Committee for Academic Policy Programs and Research. After that, I was, uh, after learning the entire system and how it works for students and their clubs, um, I was additionally an advocate for CUNY Divest, which is an environmental group at the time. Uh, the things I'd like to point out that I was unsatisfied with um, was the de-emphasis of how difficult it is for students to get spaces. My first example is um, when we tried to have uh, an Earth Day press event that we planned for over a month um, by students on different campuses, because it's not a club that's associated with one campus and it's actually an entire student movement that the University Student Senate graciously uh, acknowledged and supported over the past two and a half years. BMCC not only gave us such a difficult time um, getting space just to speak, um, after having planned with us, they tried <laughs> to not let us have a microphone for our press event. At this point, we had already invited um, a finance director from the new school who had just divested. We also had um, the, one of the council members, Steve Levin, come. We'd invited these people and they almost didn't let us even have it outside their campus. Example one. Example two, the child care center that they were talking about at City College, I was very disappointed um, to have Marina Massaro was the main organizer for this group of parents who were devastated to have the child care center taken away. They came to the University Student Senate students because they had not been able to get the administration to hear their case. And I remember going to a hearing with Marina Massaro and I also testified in another public hearing in Queens about this issue that when Frank Sanchez, I had to call him over to even address this issue, I have the what I consider to be unsatisfactory responses to these parents. I have their testimonies if you would like to have them. And the response was that, you know, under these very stringent regulations, parents can have their students here. But they had to already have been students, one, with students enrolled in this program, which was increasingly difficult to do. And secondly, the number of parents who would qualify under the the, the regulations that they created or the policy that they created for these parents at City College, I estimate to be less than 13 parents are allowed to have, will have subs, will qualify for the subsidies that the City University of New York created as a response to the taking away of the child care center at City College. Thirdly, the Macaulay Honors College students had recently come to the University Student Senate again because they were promised space at BMCC by Mr. Uh, by the trustee member uh, Frank Sanchez. At the beginning of their negotiations, my impression is that they were promised space at BMCC. And then when they, by Frank Sanchez, who helped them get the licensing for the TED Talks, I believe they're actually um, happening maybe tomorrow, uh, the 20th. Um, and when they came to us nearly two weeks when they came to the University Student Senate nearly two weeks before their event was happening, it was because they were denied space based on the fact that they were a student group that didn't belong to BMCC and then they also didn't have the funding for it. But their understanding from the beginning was that they were promised this space by a trustee member. That's my impression. Um, and by the time they came to us, it was an already planned event that had to be, re that had to be moved somewhere else. Um, fourthly, I am, I will be forever grateful to Hostos Community College for allowing me to take an e-permitted class because at Hunter College there was not space for me. 
um, as a pre-nursing student to take anatomy physiology, which was required to become a nursing student, to move on with my career. Um, and what I was very sad to hear from Hostos Community College is that I think that there's not a distinction being made by administration about spaces where students can be versus sta like spaces where students can gather. And I think that it should be noted that even in Hunter College, we do have these beautiful bridges, but you are not allowed to post posters. You are not allowed to congregate. You are not allowed privacy. And I think that the Hostos Community College space that they were referring to is a place where you can sit, not a place where you can gather. Um, and I want that distinction to be made because I think that I've seen consistently since I've been at the City University of New York and Hunter College and also a student at Hostos that these spaces are not being made for students. Um, additionally, I was embarrassed, embarrassed that as the president of the Nursing Student Association of New York State, when I asked for space at our own health professions location, we have this beautiful space um, and we have to have our meetings on Sundays. And that's because we have students come from all over New York to come to our college and I invited them because that's where we wanted to have a meeting. And we take turns at different campuses for this board. And I was so embarrassed that the week before everyone was coming, I still didn't know the room number of where we were going to have our meeting. And I was even more embarrassed that security was not informed of the room that we, we did have our reservation on. And I was even more embarrassed that the room that we got was on the sixth floor of our health sciences center. And I was not helped by my administration. And so we sat in these tiny little desks having invited people. These are future nursing leaders from the entire state that sat in tiny little desks. And I was embarrassed for my school. And not only that, I was embarrassed representing them. Um, and so I'd also like to point out, this is the last thing I'm gonna point out, is that I have watched the administration deter students from these types of activities that used to make students very proud to be at the City University of New York. And recently when we had a Title IX he, um, hearing about equal education, the administration was asked a very difficult question about who our public security officers now are at Hunter. I fear that because our new director of public safety at Hunter College is a former FBI agent or administrator or wherever he came from, this was asked of our administration and they did not answer the question. My classmates are not criminals. The, the students that continue to be at Hunter College who, I mean, recently we had a million student march and the point of it was supposed to be gathering to make tuition an, a primary issue for students. And I left that protest to go to another protest because they're still building infrastructure for natural gas and that's an entirely different issue. But what I found online uh, after this was that students were like the media had taken this issue and made it completely not about tuition hikes. I spent an hour talking to students on Facebook about what the actual purpose of that protest was and it was not portrayed. So when the trustee brought about the fact that we have this digital area and students are able to congregate, I would like to point out that that, that is not adequate. Students get misinformation online. They are not given the correct information. It's very difficult as a former student, having just graduated, to even communicate with these new students what these issues are online because you have to type it and there's no face to face. And I fear that this growing pushing out of students who do have very pertinent issues at, at our universities and very serious issues are, con are being quieted in very disturbing ways. And I urge the, the council to really take a good look at what they're doing and how they're doing it. And please advocate for my classmates because I know they're not criminals. They might not know everything. They might be learning. They might be 19 years old. But those students have things to say. And when they voice their issues, I watch them quietly be sh shut down. Sorry. 
Um, hi, my name is Rajib. I'm part of the Revolutionary Student Coordinating Committee and also part of Students Without Borders, an organization throughout CUNY and outside of CUNY. And there's a lot of concerns within CUNY of repressions, repressing students, and not only students, also community members. And one of the things that they want to talk about is also about um, the investments of CUNYs and what has CUNY has been investing into. And we are aware that CUNY is predominantly made up of working class students and also black and brown youth and oppressed nationalities and oppressed genders, right? Now, throughout the years, though, throughout the years, we have noticed that there's a different uh, back background of people coming into CUNY. Um, we see that there's gentrification kicking in our communities, right? For City College, for example, you got when gentrification hitting Harlem, City College is in the heart of Harlem, right? And how does gentrification actually plays a role in actually affecting students to be able to be blocked from actually attending schools, being attend, be able to be attended to go to black and brown students to be attended to go to CUNY schools and take advantage of the resources. Um, um, with that being said, CUNY's investments actually have been investing two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars and two hundred seventy-five two hundred thousand dollars. Pardon me, two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars plus on um, companies like G4S that creates uh, which you call prisons, detention centers, also are part of the, uh, um, also helping out the apartheid that's happening in Israel amongst, the genocide that's happening amongst Palestinian people. And CUNY likes to, um, how do I say, likes to avoid the topics of Zionism. And when they talk about Zionism, they think we're being anti-Semitic. Now, for CUNY to say such a thing like that is very anti-Semitic, because Zionism is not Judaism. Zionism is a political ideology of actually colonizing a group of people, of Palestinian people. And what's going on is also, like, not only also does uh, what's happening, the CUNY is investing into, uh, into Israel checkpoints, but also CUNY is investing into private prisons and also detention centers. Now, if CUNY is so about the students and about the people in our community, why is it that is it that CUNY is working with the IDF? Why is CUNY working with the NYPD, who are harassing our community members, the working class students who come and attend uh, these CUNY schools? Why is it that this is happening? Now, uh, I'm also part of the CUNY Prison Divest campaign, and we've been facing a lot of repression amongst administration from Office of Student Activity, like Mr. Mars, and you got the dean too who are here too. We've been facing repression from not being able to even have our freedom of speech being put out, from talking about uh, what's, ha what's happening in throughout, throughout, throughout the world and also what's happening in CUNY, what are the policies that are being made. Um, we spoke about passing out flyers. We're being stopped and harassed by the securities of CUNY, securities in BMCC, securities in CCNY, Hunter College, where we're not even able to pass out a flyer that's actually telling the truth about what is CUNY actually investing into. Um, so like the talk about like there's not money for, for space, well, you're wasting so much money on, on things that's already harming the people who attend these schools to be able to get the knowledge that they want to seek, to get the practical practice that they need to apply into society. Now, CUNY, like, lot of, I wish a lot of the people who were here earlier, the panelists were here, I wish they were able to hear this because I don't know if they're aware of this because um, it's a shame. It's a shame. These are the same board of trustees people who are who's um, supposed to be looking out for us, but they're really not looking out for us. They have their own. They serve their own interests, um, and and it's also very surprising that CUNY does not even let the students in their own campuses know about this today. So there's not even that many students actually came out today. So it's kind. Of, that's also a shame. Um, and so the repression that we have been facing is not only that we're not able to flyer. But it's also these bureaucratic measurements where it's slowing down progress for us to be, be able to have events like Know Your Rights training, for students to be able to know how to defend themselves in, in a legal way, in the sense where when a NYPD does stop you, what do you do? What do you do when an immigration custom enforcement tries to take away you from your family? What do you do? What, is the, what are these lessons that you should be able to learn? But CUNY, and administration as well, and as well as professors, let's be real, there are very racist professors too involved into um, the faculty are also are racist too at the same time. And there's been a lot of repression and sexual harassment done by actually, um, uh, by the professors, by administration, right? And like a lot of Title IX violations, like Hunter College, what happened over the summer. And um, a lot of these things are not being put out for the students to know about. And it's like, 
yeah, how does this connect with space? It connects in the space in the sense that if we want to talk about building space, they don't want us to talk about building space. Because they know that like the Maurice Core Community Center was a space where people were having progressive ideas and sharing different ideas out to be able to build a movement that was actually happening since the 1960s. And a lot of these, a lot of these things, you know, also notice like how the daycare centers are being taken away. I'm hearing that Queens College daycare center might be taken away in two semesters from now. Now I don't know if this is true or not, but this is what I'm hearing, and I, w I wish someone was here to actually answer that question. And I hope you guys could speak with um, CUNY to figure out more about that. And we 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 have we have also gotten repression from the students of justice in Pal um, administration was giving uh, repression towards the students of justice in Palestine in Hunter College, where um, their room was, their club, and their club room was illegally like uh, uh, suspended. The club was suspended with no type of, uh, what's that called, evidence to say like, hey, because um, apparently there was this student who, um, if you would like me to say the person's name, I will, I'll be willing to say the person's name too, because um, what he's doing is really, is harm, very, very harmful from other student members, where they choose, CUNY choose to attack the people who are actually doing good for the people, but should be actually att attacking the, the students, the faculty, and also the administrations who's not really doing good for the people. Because if, if we're having, if we're having progressive ideas being shared out, that's actually gonna be benefiting our community and be benefiting the students, why is it that CUNY is not repressing the people who are stopping us from doing that, right? So, and administration is also involved in this. The securities are involved in this. And like CUNY spent $30,000 on weaponry, on riot weapons, on hollow bullets, that apparently the NYPD don't even have hollow bullets. So it's like, why is that the reason why they're spending this much money on, on weaponry and all these uh, things? We're students, right? What is it that they're afraid of, right? Um, there's, there's also been issues of once again, security guards in CUNY was in, within inside of CUNY was not always around too at the same time. When I believe it was the, the it was the tuition hikes that was happening during I could be wrong, maybe 1989 was it? I think you could correct me probably. During um, when securities were enforced into CUNY offices were enforced into uh, throughout CUNY, and I mean we've just been getting repression. Like clubs can't even be formed because. Professors are afraid of becoming uh, their faculty advisors because they're afraid of losing their jobs because they know that administration will be on top of them. And like this is the same thing. Like a lot of repression has clubs been facing. Students Without Borders throughout CUNY has been facing repression. Students for Justice in Palestine, Revolutionary Student Coordinating Committee, uh, um, Sojas from John Jay, all these different type of organizations and clubs are facing repression. And now. Earlier, one of the panelists saying that, hey, we could make votes and, you know, students could vote and this and that. But I just found out a few days ago, like, the student government are only able to take care of, actually, the student government members among the decisions, but not actually decisions amongst the students. Like, if there is a violation that's hap that happens, the student government is not allowed to uh, do the investigation. Is the security guard supposed to be doing the investigation? It's the CUNY office, the NYPD. But at the same time, it's the, these are the same people who portray these um, actions, these ideologies, patriarchal ideologies, into the system. So, like, how do you have someone who's already portraying these type of ideologies and trying to also like push it down and not like worry about it too much? But this is actually real, legitimized issues that people are getting harassed and, and seriously harassed, and racist comments are being put out everywhere. Um, someone mentioned something about online on Facebook, social networking, that there is this, there is a Facebook like page known as um, CCNY Secrets. There was actually multiple times people put out their secrets saying that they were getting raped and harassed in City College in the library. And guess what? The security guard is just putting a thumbs up. Now, what does that mean? Like, it's, it's, it's a, this is, this is it's very, very, it's very, very difficult to see and hear this at the same time, because <laughs> it's like, like at, this, at this very point, it's like we're losing hope for CUNY, and CUNY has not really been, throughout history, we've seen since the 60s, working, working class students, oppressed nationalities, oppressed genders, are trying to fight for something that belongs to them, but at the same time, they're being repressed. So, I hope you guys can figure out more details about what's going on with CUNY, the Board of Trustees, and why are they repressing students for, 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 for activism. Um, I hope you guys could find out more. I hope you guys could contact us. Um, I will give you my contact for sure. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Next. Oh, sorry. And would you pronounce your name? Rudolph, ma'am. Okay, Rudolph. But people call me Rudy. I, okay. I have a lot of words where people misspell my name. It's, 
It's, it's and for the record, would you please give us your full name? Yeah, Rudol Murado. Murado, okay. Do you want I spell? Because people putting PH, except they have... You can spell it for us, yes. M-U-R-A-D-O-V. Okay. R-U-D-O-L-F. Thank you. Okay. Um, I feel a little bit over... I like to say good evening, and... and I, I felt like I'm coming from the from the college from Kingsborough Community College are very small and we are from there in Brooklyn and what's Can you get a little closer to the mic? Oh sorry man. A little sorry. closer to the mic. It's like a um Kingsborough Community College are s small and, and we are in a Brooklyn and actually say I was uh, never heard about the situation what's happened with you guys and that's why I took the notes to make sure that my students will be know about that. Um Going to my name is Rudy. I'm a I'm a currently student at Kingsborough Community College. I'm a president of the campus activity board. I'm also representative of Kingsborough as USS United University Student Senate, and I'm also student ambassador. Uh, Kingsborough College College has a unique student government body. Uh, we have a uh, four different councils, which are liberal arts council, math and science, business, as well as health and uh, health and education. And also we have 105 clubs, um, which I'm member of the 31, 35 of them. Uh, we have a very diverse student population reflecting the, our borough. We have 142 nationals are represent, and also the, many of them as main languages are spoken in our campus. For many of our students, Kingsborough Kevin College became second home, as well as for me. I love my college, I love my community. Uh, like I, like many other, uh, I can I can sorry for my language. I can academic. academic. Thank you. Uh, it's my fourth language. Mm -hmm. Ac academic institution K Kingsborough Community College faced many challenges, and one of them, unfortunately, space for the, our students. Uh, but under new president of the Farley Herzog, uh, special presidential committee was created to to um, solve this problem. Uh, this committee was considered the faculty, staff, and student representatives who will work collaboratively to try to resolve this issue. Uh, and planning, creating, developing a new student un union and multicultural center which will be transformed the, the way many students come together, planning events, uh, studying, and just relax for, for, hard, for long hard working school schools. We have everything we have everything in a place except the funding. The administration understands that having dedicated space for students to socialize is important and working to find private resources to uh, support the, the center. Any help will be provided will be very grateful. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the panel for their testimony. And uh, I understand and sympathize with what it is that you've said have been some of the conditions that you have faced. And I once again want to encourage people to look to the activities of the students in Missouri, at the University of Missouri, how they came together and organized and how they forced a response to the issues that they saw existing on their campus. And I would encourage you to attend hearings such as these as the Board of Trustees from CUNY has meetings and hearings. You're allowed to present testimony. It's limited, you won't have as much time as you have here, but if you're very focused on what your issues are and your concerns are, mm -hmm. I would invite you to submit your testimony or go and give your testimony mm -hmm. so that they are aware. Oftentimes, we complain to each other internally, and we don't address the issue to those that have the ability to analyze it and make a difference. So I would encourage you to continue to raise your voice, mm. to continue to organize students, and students have got to be able to stand up, as well as faculty, and take a position on those things that they think are important. And uh, sometimes that does mean you become a target because when everybody's in the same level and no one's taking any leadership, no one's a target. But when someone has the integrity, the commitment, the audacity, 
or whatever adjective you want to put to that to stand up and say, no, this is not right, or I see a deficit here, or this is something that needs to be addressed, that person oftentimes becomes a target. And we know, looking back, talking about the 1960s, late 60s, Dr. Martin Luther King is a perfect example. It was fine as long as he talked about civil rights, but when he talked about the war issue, he became a target of this nation and of individuals. And when uh, he came in 19, early 1968, he couldn't find a church other than one that would allow him to come. So there is a price that comes with being bold, but if you're committed to the cause and if you can rally people around you, uh, perhaps later in history when the story's told, people will be able to acknowledge that. At that time, he was the most feared man in America, FBI was after him. Now everybody loves Dr. King. Oh, he was so great, and oh, I was with him. But uh, at the moment, at the contemporary time that it was happening, mm -hmm. he didn't have those adulations. So if it's important to you and you feel that it's something that you want to keep your voice on, I would um, encourage you to do that. I do have to end this session. My council does have uh, another meeting that they have to go to.